but I think we should just try to make some progress. Hopefully members are in agreement with that. So we will move uh, swiftly back to where we were, which is that I... Could, members, could I ask please for some quiet? Thank you. And I call Amendment 1 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 22. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? It's a long time to think about it, President Officer, but I'm still inclined not to move. Thank you. Uh, not moved, therefore. I call Amendment 2 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 22. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Similarly not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 26 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 22. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Um, so we can test our app. Moved. Moved. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament has not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their vote now. The vote is now closed. Uh, point of order, Bill Kidd. Please, thank you. Um, apparently, this is still trying to connect, so um, I would have voted no, but there you go. Thank you, Mr Kidd. Your vote will be recorded. I call Shirley Ann Somerville for a point of order. Thank you, President Officer. Likewise, I would have voted no. Thank you. Your vote will be recorded. Point of order from Alec, uh, Alex Cole Hamilton online. Alec, presiding officer, I couldn't, uh, my, couldn't connect, so I would have voted no. Thank you. Your vote will be recorded. The result of the vote in Amendment Number 26 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes, 27, no, 84. Uh, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 27 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 22. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Um, the, I call Amendment 28 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 22. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 29 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 22. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 3 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 22. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. We will now move to Group 3 uh, on calculation of the levy. I call Amendment 30 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 31. I call on the Minister move, to move Amendment 30 and to speak to both amendments in the group. Minister. President and Officer, I move Amendment 30 and will speak to both amendments in the group. Amendments 30 and 31 would change the way that a visitor levy is calculated. Together, they remove from the bill the current provision in Section 51B, which extracts any amount paid as commission to a travel booking agent before the amount of visitor levy to be paid on a transaction is calculated. This provision was included in the bill to avoid a visitor levy being applied to an amount that included such commission. However, since Stage 2, Visit Scotland, the National Tourism Agency, have expressed 
expressed concerns that this provision could allow someone to deduce the amount of commission that an accommodation provider is paying to a travel booking agent. The levels of commission paid can vary considerably depending on individual contracts and are commercially sensitive information. The Government therefore has explored this issue with business organisations who are supportive of making this change and removing the current provision on commission from the Bill. Local Government also support this change. In addition, it has the added advantage of making the visitor levy calculation even simpler to understand and apply. The Government has therefore brought forward these amendments. Yep, certainly. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to the Minister for giving me and I think his point around simplicity is, is one that's important and well made and one that has often been made uh, in the, uh, the lead up to this bill. Much of that will be contained within the, the statutory guidance. I was just wondering if the, the Minister might elaborate, uh, you know, given the controversies around whether it should be a flat fee or a percentage, uh, what, what consideration there will be in the guidance for uh, simplicity of calculation uh, for local authorities devising such schemes? Minister. I think the member makes that a very important point. A central area of contention in the legislation was, as he highlights, whether it should be a flat fee or indeed a percentage rate. Indeed, um, in earlier consideration of the bill, uh, a potential hybrid model was mooted. We have op opted for the uh, percentage model as was introduced, recognising that a consensus was not achieved to move to a flat rate model. So I absolutely agree on the imperative that we ensure administration is as straightforward as possible. So in order to achieve that, as we will touch on, I'm sure, with further amendments in the legislation, there are the significant consultation requirements that precede the introduction of any visitor levy. There there are further amendments that I will bring forward um, later this afternoon to introduce a visitor levy forum to ensure ongoing consultation and engagement with business. And of course, there is the statutory guidance with the expert group led by Visit Scotland, which brings together experts from business and local government to ensure that these issues are being addressed. Further, at stage two, we put that guidance as highlighted onto statutory footing. And further amendments that I will bring forward this afternoon will specify things that have to be included in that guidance and will allow for that list to be amended. So there's a number of ways in which we can ensure, through collaborative working at a local level where a visitor levy has been implemented, and indeed through statutory guidance and the requirements that have to be in the statutory guidance, to ensure that the guidance and the support is there to ensure the most effective and straightforward administration of this is possible. A key priority for me throughout um, work on developing this proposal is to ensure as much administrative consistency and simplicity for business being subject to a visitor levy across Scotland, while allowing that local flexibility to ensure that a visitor levy policy and the revenues raised can, support most can respond most appropriately to the assets and needs to help to grow and develop and sustain that local visitor economy. So I hope that provides a member with some reassurance. Officer, just to conclude in my uh, remarks with regards to amendments 30 and 31, we have brought, through the, brought forward these amendments in response to concerns raised by industry. We do actually, as, it, as suggested um, uh, previously, that lead to a simpler approach. They have the support of local government and industry, and I would encourage members in Parliament to support them. Thank you, Minister. I see that no other members are seeking to speak uh, in this group. Uh, has the Minister anything further to add by way of wind-up? No, nothing further. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 31 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 30. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. We now move to Group 4 on circumstances in which the levy is not to be payable or may be reimbursed. I call Amendment 32 in the name of Ross Greer. Grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings, and I call on Ross Greer to move Amendment 32 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move Amendment 32. I'd like to uh, thank by starting the Minister for his uh, excellent outreach and engagement on this bill and thank the, the legislation team for bearing with me as I drafted these amendments. Um, I am offering Amendment 32 as an alternative to Amendment 4 in the Minister's name. These both concern capping the number of nights that the visitor levy would apply to. I offer it as an alternative, but it is worth emphasising at the start uh, that both amendments could be agreed by Parliament and are uh, compatible. I offer it as an alternative, though, because I think that the principle of this bill is that we are empowering local government and therefore any power that we add to this bill, in this case capping the number of nights, should be a power, a decision that sits 
with local government uh, themselves. So, for that reason, the, the Greens will oppose Amendment 4. We, we recognise and appreciate uh, the comments that the Minister has made in the past about this, that the, the Scottish Government certainly at the moment wouldn't be inclined uh, to, to implement um, a, a cap as it stands. But you can't guarantee that of any government in the future, and it's simply not a power that we think should sit at a national level. We do think it's entirely reasonable to have the power to cap the number of nights, but that that should sit at a local level, because it is the kind of area where significant variation across the country, for example, where one particular area may have a significant infrastructure project that requires some people staying there for a prolonged period of time in overnight accommodation that wouldn't apply elsewhere, is exactly the kind of reason why that decision should sit with the local authorities. So for that, uh, I offer Amendment uh, 32 uh, as opposed to Amendment 4, but again, I would emphasise that if both were passed, they would be uh, compatible. Um, we also support uh, Amendment 5 in the Minister's name and Amendment 8 from uh, Jeremy Balfour. Um, amendments 35 through 46 and 51 and 52 in the name of Miles Briggs and Pam Gosal uh, will not be supported by the Green Group. Going back to that principle that this is about empowering local government, um, I think that these are a step too far in creating uh, new national uh, requirements for the Bill, and ultimately these are decisions uh, that should be made by local authorities. We talk a lot in this Parliament uh, about empowering local government. This Bill does that, and I do not want to start rolling back on that by adding more complications and more rules set at a national level. Thank you. Thank you. I call on the Minister to speak to Amendment 4 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I will speak to all the amendments in this group, including my own amendments 4, 5 and 68. Amendment 32 by Ross Greer, as we had just heard, will make it explicit that a local authority can place a cap on the maximum number of nights to which a visitor levy can apply in relation to a period of consecutive nights in one place of overnight accommodation. We view that this local discretion is already possible under the Bill, but the Government is happy to make this explicit, so will support this amendment. On the same issue, Amendment 4 would give Ministers the power to create a national cap on the maximum number of nights to which a visitor levy could apply. This reflects discussions I have had in light of an amendment brought forward by Daniel Johnson at Stage 2. It would create a tool that could be used in the future, if necessary, to set a national cap after consultation with local government and businesses and with the approval of Parliament. Amendment 5 is intended to add a reassurance to the Bill that a local authority will be required, as part of the initial process it must follow in introducing a scheme, to make a statement about any potential exemptions to a scheme. The amendment would make any exemptions proposed something that have to be explicitly highlighted at this early stage. I will now turn to Miles Briggs, amendments 35 to 45 and 51. We seek to put in place 10 exemptions that would apply in every single visitor levy scheme. I have sympathy for some of the scenarios he has highlighted, but the sheer volume is a concern. Business has consistently told me that the more exemptions there are to a visitor levy scheme, the more complexity there is and the greater the administrative cost. There are also exemptions in the list that lack a robust definition or that are irrelevant in many local authorities. To take one example, Amendment 42 seeks to exempt those who are on work or business travel. However, what would happen if a visitor travelled with her family, held one business meeting at the start of the visit and one at the end? Would that be a family holiday or a business trip? Creating this sort of amendment would leave so many holes in a visitor levy scheme that it would be easier to say who would pay it. Amendment 51 supplies some definitions, but still leaves others, such as technician, undefined. As another example, Amendment 39 seeks to create an exemption for those stranded due to a ferry cancellation. That might be relevant, I appreciate, in some local authorities, but as we would understand, of no relevance in others. The amendments would still require every local authority to include the exemptions and set out practical arrangements for the administration, whether or not relevant to their local circumstances. Given that a local authority has the power to create local exemptions, I do not believe that these amendments are necessary to be imposed at a national level for every single scheme. An island authority or those with direct ferry links to the islands could already create such an exemption if they believed it necessary. 
While the list of proposed exemptions is long, there may still be other circumstances that are relevant to local circumstances that we have not considered. The Bill already contains a power in Section 10 for Ministers to create national exemptions, should there be a need to do so, in addition to local exemptions created by local authorities. I am open to using that power in the future if there is consensus among local government, parliament and businesses that a specific exemption at a national level is required. Nevertheless, I believe that a strong case for a national exemption has been made in relation to Amendment 8 from Jeremy Balfour, and the Government is therefore able to support it. This amendment is specific about those it will cover, clearly identifying those in receipt of disability benefits, and allows local authorities to make the practical arrangements for the exemption. It also reflects existing arrangements, but I will let Mr Balfour set out his amendment, of course, in more detail. I will now turn to Amendment 46 by Pam Gosso. This would seek to ensure that a visitor levy scheme must specify whether or not the levy was payable in relation to those with an annual turnover below the VAT threshold. I know the interaction of VAT and the visitor levy has been a concern of Pam Gosso during the passage of the Bill, and I thank her for bringing this amendment forward. The Government's long-standing position is that any local authority thinking of introducing a visitor levy will need to consider the potential VAT implications that it would have for relevant businesses in their area. A local authority could, if it chose, create an exemption from a visitor levy for those businesses that are near the VAT threshold. Accordingly, the Government will support Amendment 46, which makes it clear that the authority's decision on this must be clearly stated. I would note that the supplementary Amendment 52, which adds a definition of VAT threshold to the Bill, does not, in our view, add the correct reference to the current VAT threshold. The Government has therefore brought forward Amendment 68, which references the correct legislative position. I would therefore ask Pam Gosso not to press Amendment 52, which the Government does not support, but to support Amendment 68 instead. I am conscious of time, President Officer, so I will conclude my remarks there. Thank you. And I call Jeremy Balfour to speak to Amendment 8 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I start by declaring an interest in regard to being in the receipt of PIP? And can I also thank the Minister for his constructive engagement on this issue? As most people within the Chamber are aware, those with disability often are the poorest within our society. We have financial restraints due to perhaps lack of employment opportunities and also costs that relate to the disability. Uh, a holiday, uh, a trip away, is often something that has to be planned months in advance. And anything that would stop them being able to take that break, I think, shouldn't be getting their way. The system that will be introduced will be up to each local authority to decide but we are laying down the principle and the types of benefits somebody has to be on to be able to get this exemption. Uh, the good news is, um, presiding officer, that this is, I think, a, sim a simple system that is already in use, and local authorities and those who will have to administrate it locally will be able to work well. If, for example, you went up to the uh, Festival Theatre here in Edinburgh, or if you were lucky enough to go to Euro Disney, or Legoland, or Blackpool, or other places that I go on holiday, this scheme is already working. The DWP, or Social Security Scotland in due course, do issue an annual letter telling you that you are entitled to a benefit and at what rate that benefit gives you. You are able to take that letter to the appropriate venue, show the person that letter, and then get the exemption that they um, offer, depending on where you go. There will be no cost to the taxpayer, as these letters have to be issued already and are very common practice. It will also mean that the person who owns the hotel, the bed and breakfast, won't have to make a judgment on whether someone is disabled or not. It will be only those that are, are within the categories within the amendment that receive it and they will have to produce a letter to show that that is applicable. It will apply for all accommodation, which means those coming um, to B&Bs, caravan sites or wherever will benefit from it. Um, I am also pleased that there are all charities like Ewan's Guide who can provide training for accommodation providers. So again, there should be no charge for local authorities in regard to that. 
Um, I believe this is, um, will make, in some ways, a small difference, but for many disabled families, will make a big difference. Again, I thank the Minister uh, for his engagement, and I hope everyone in the Chamber will be able to support the amendment this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs to speak to Amendment 35 and uh, other amendments in the thank group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'm starting to take it personally now, Minister, in terms of the amendments which have been uh, accepted. But from the outset uh, of the bill, I've argued for a national set of exemptions to be developed. Indeed, when the bill was initially published, it contained a voucher scheme for exemptions. Sadly, this had little to no detail of how that scheme would work. Uh, in practice, and I have attempted to work with the Minister and the Government on these uh, important amendments and welcome the fact that the Government have accepted uh, the cases I've put forward previously to exempt children and young people under 18 from the Bill and also welcome the progress uh, which has been managed to be made by the Government in relation to my colleague Jeremy Balfour's amendment uh, and also uh, the amendment in the name of my colleague Pam goes all around uh, that exemption uh, thresholds as well. Um, I have significant concerns, um, though, that the short-term le legislation which we have seen, which was poorly drafted, um, has resulted in a postcode lottery and different councils taking forward uh, different uh, schemes. And the development of that in terms of these, I think, is, is damaging. My amendments uh, 35 and 38 uh, which I have drafted, how the government suggested they should be, um, would, would provide national exemptions, which I believe should be on the face of the bill, including for Scots visiting family members in hospitals, hospices or care homes. Uh, for many Scots who support the establishment of a visitor levy as well, I believe many think this is for visitors and tourists uh, coming to our country. Uh, the reality, though, of this bill is something very different. As I stated from the outset, this is not a visitor levy. This is an accommodation tax. Everyone in Scotland in the future booking accommodation will face an additional tax on top of the cost of doing so. And even if they, for example, are moving um, from local uh, B&Bs, are looking to book a local B&B whilst work is being done for their home, for example, to achieve net zero, as the Greens say uh, they want to see, uh, of those who have been impacted by flooding. For example, we've seen that across uh, Angus communities. They will pay a tax uh, for staying in B&Bs and guest houses whilst this takes place. My Amendment 44 would also introduce, therefore, an exemption for people living in a local authority area where the levy uh, is in place. An Amendment 45 would also um, look towards exempting uh, permanent residents living in Scotland. Given the vulnerability of cancellations of the ferry fleet, which is an increasingly uh, seen in many of our island communities, uh, Amendment 39 would also provide an exemption for visitors paying the levy again when they have seen a ferry cancellation. Taken as a collection of amendments, I believe these exemptions on the face of the bill can provide a set of safeguards to protect people in Scotland from paying this tax and staying away um, for home reasons, um, staying away from their home for reasons I believe all of us uh, would not want to see people paying uh, for what is meant to be tourist activity. They should rightly be outlined, I believe, on the face of the bill, and I therefore move the amendments in my name. Thank you. And I call Pam Gosell to speak to Amendment 46 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I put on record my thanks to the clerks of the Local Government and Housing and Planning Committee for the work that they have put into our consideration of the Bill. I would also like to thank the organisations who have sent briefings to members, as I know how much time and effort these take. At Stage 2, I brought forward an amendment which sought to exclude accommodation providers operating below the VAT threshold from being subject to the levy. The amendment was rejected by the Minister on the basis that local authorities could choose to exempt businesses operating under the VAT threshold if they wished to do so. Today I am bringing forward Amendment 46 and 52, which indicate that a visitor levy scheme must specify whether the levy is not payable in relation to accommodation which has an annual turnover below the VAT threshold. I have made it clear throughout the Bill's passage through Parliament that this is the last thing the tourism sector needs right now. The levy will add cost and complexity for those running on tight margins, and as the Association of Self-Caterers best put it, the industry felt it was being shrunk 
by regulation while also being taxed on top. Operating a small business in Scotland is exceptionally costly. This challenge is intensified by business rates, VAT and stringent regulations on short-term lets. According to the Federation of Small Businesses, approximately 2,000 to 3,000 small accommodation providers are not VAT registered. A significant concern for many of these operators is the risk of exceeding VAT threshold due to the levy. Instead of paying VAT from actual profits, small businesses would effectively be paying VAT because of their new role as an unpaid tax collector for local councils. The Scottish Conservatives want to see a workable solution embedded in the Bill, and that is why I have watered down my previous amendment. Although it falls far too short for requiring those operating under the VAT threshold to be exempt, it introduces an exemption for businesses that have an annual turnover below the VAT threshold. In its briefing, COSLA, COSLA's second request is to keep exemptions local. This amendment does not contradict that. I hope that helps answer my, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Ross Greer's concern. My amendment has been supported by the Association of Self-Caterers and the Scottish Land and Estates. Happy to not, not move Amendment 52 and support the Minister's Amendment 68. Good to hear that the Minister is supporting my amendment on 46. And I therefore ask members across the chamber to support my amendment 46. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Mark Griffin. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. But, uh, briefly on the, the range of um, exemptions that would be introduced uh, through a number of these amendments, um, we support Amendment 8 in the name of Jeremy Balfour um, for um, the reasons that Mr Balfour set out, but also because of um, how he set that out, the detail of how that would be evidence that is clear to understand for, for an accommodation um, provider. Now, we support the, the principle of a number of the, the other amendments uh, as well. You know, we are sympathetic with those who are um, receiving respite, visiting family in hospital, um, visiting those in prison. But we, on an, an, an individual basis, support many of them. But similar to the, the concerns the Minister set out, we are concerned about the cumulative impact of all of these amendments, also concerned about the, the impact on um, accommodation providers as to how they will obtain proof of uh, exemption um, or not. Um, so I would like to um, put on record that we have a great deal of sympathy for another, a, a number of them, but um, would like some um, reassurance as to how they would um, operate cumulatively and how we would expect um, accommodation providers to um, receive evidence of those. Thank you. And I call Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And, and again, uh, briefly, I'd just like to speak to uh, the amendments uh, in this group relating to both uh, the VAT threshold and uh, the, the number of nights. Uh, those were both uh, areas that I brought forward amendments at uh, stage two, and I'm very pleased to see them. I have to say, on, in terms of the maximum number of nights, I think this is an important one because this is a transient visitors' levy. But there becomes a point where a stay is no longer a visit, but actually someone is actually, uh, to a degree, permanently resident, uh, and that's particularly regarding work. Uh, my view uh, and, and concern stem from uh, the, the, the nature of the Edinburgh festivals and the fact that very many people come and stay for quite a, a prolonged period of time in Edinburgh during the summer, and they are no longer visitors at that point. They are working and contributing to the local economy in that way. I would have preferred to have seen a, a, a threshold uh, set for that, uh, but I recognise this bill is a balance between setting uh, uh, stipulations nationally and providing local discretion. My concern is that this is a levy that, that, that where local authorities will be incentivised to sort of maximise the, the number of opportunities they have uh, for this levy to be levied. But, but nonetheless, I recognise that. And likewise, can I just echo the comments made by Pam Gozel? There's a great number of uh, accommodation providers who are very small in Scotland, who will be running their businesses from a, a petty cash tin and an exercise book. It's really important that we don't unduly burden them. And I think uh, having a provision around the VAT threshold is a, a sensible and proportionate one uh, for this legislation. And I support the amendments uh, regarding the VAT threshold. Thank you very much. Thank you. I call Ross Greer to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 32. 
Thank you, President Officer. Just to be uh, brief, I appreciate the Government's support for Amendment 32, and I just want to recognise Daniel Johnson's work on advancing the argument uh, around the, the matter of the cap on the number of nights. I have already outlined in uh, opening why we believe that should sit with local authorities, but uh, as Mr Johnson outlined, there are a range of reasons why it would be entirely reasonable for a local authority uh, to set a cap given particular circumstances in their area, whether it be in Edinburgh during the festival, whether it be in the Highlands, if there is a significant infrastructure project, for example, that requires a large number of people to stay in overnight accommodation for a period of time, we just fundamentally believe that that is a decision that should be taken at a local level when what we are doing here is creating uh, a new national, uh, a new local uh, tax. Rather. Um, on the, the point of uh, exemptions, again, the, I was quite taken by the, the Minister's um, point around the potential confusion that is created if we create too many exemptions, too many national rules and requirements uh, around these, particularly uh, when there is not necessarily a clear distinction in some of these cases. The example that was given of a family holiday that uh, a business meeting or a couple of days of work are tacked on to either side of. I have definitely made myself unpopular on family holidays before by putting a day of work or a couple of meetings uh, at either end of them, so I can, I can absolutely see how, how that would be possible. Fundamentally, if what we are doing here is trying to empower our colleagues in local government to make decisions that suit their area, we should be giving them the greatest level of discretion possible, as was outlined in the causal briefing. So I will be pressing Amendment 32. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 33 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 21. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 4 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 32. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. I call Jeremy Balfour for a point of order. My phone connected, presiding officer. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr. Balfour. We'll ensure it's recorded. I call Russell Finlay for a point of order. I call Russell Finlay for a point of order. My app didn't connect. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Finlay. We'll ensure that your vote is recorded. I call Daniel Johnson for a point of order. I would have voted yes. Thank you, Mr Johnson. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number four in the name of Tom Arthur is yes 99, no 12. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment five in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 32. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we move on to Group 5, Visitor Levy Forums. And I call Amendment 6 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 13, 14, 15 and 16. 
the Minister to move Amendment 6 and speak to all amendments in the group. During my meetings with accommodation providers and business organisations, I heard a genuine concern that whilst the Bill put in place measures for consultation before a visitor levy scheme was introduced, business wanted a means of making sure there was ongoing and meaningful engagement once the visitor levy scheme was introduced. The Government has listened to those views and has therefore brought forward the amendments in this group. Together, these amendments will require the creation of visitor levy forums and put in place suitable measures to ensure they have the opportunity and information to contribute their views effectively. Amendment 13 would require a local authority who establishes a visitor levy scheme to set up a visitor levy forum. This would have to be done within six months of the decision to introduce a scheme that is during the implementation period for a scheme which is currently in the Bill. Thereafter, the forum would have to meet regularly and at least twice a year and discuss and advise the local authority on the scheme. The forum's membership would be drawn from communities, businesses engaged in tourism and tourist organisations in its areas. Councillors can be part of the forum so they can directly hear the views of its members, but they cannot be a majority. The exact membership of each forum will therefore reflect the local area. Happy to give way to Ariane Burgess. Ariane Burgess. Thank you for giving away, uh, Minister. Uh, I just wanted to seek your assurance that the, uh, the for while the forum is welcome, I want to make sure that it's balanced and also uh, that, uh, that it is for consultation and that decisions will still be made by local elected members who are, are, democ are democratically accountable. Minister. I'm, I'm grateful to Aria and Burgess for her intervention. And I can confirm that this is a forum, is a consultative body, but of course um, final decisions would be taken by democratically elected local members who are accountable to their electorate. So happy to provide that reassurance. Presiding officer, amendments 6 and 14 would require a local authority to consult the forum when it is considering modifying a visitor levy scheme or consulting under section 17 of the bill on how funding is used. Amendments 15 and 16 would require a local authority to provide the forum with the local authority's annual report on the visitor levy scheme and the more substantial three-yearly review that must be carried out. These amendments together give business and communities a robust mechanism for ongoing and meaningful engagement on a visitor levy scheme. And I ask members to support them. I move Amendment 6. Thank you. I call Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I very much welcome these amendments. They are in line with the group of amendments I brought at stage two. Um, I think it is important to put on record that the government from the outset have said this is about improving uh, investment in tourism. Um, significantly, this will be income coming from our accommodation sector, uh, which isn't necessarily directly linked uh, to, to um, tourism. Um, facilities which this money might end up being uh, spent on uh, but having an opportunity to input into that is really important and um, I also think what will be key going forward is what this looks like on the tin when it's actually uh, implemented because there are concerns and certainly as an Edinburgh MSP I have specific concerns that government may want to withdraw from our cultural uh, sector and, and spending on that and this may be where they point towards councils seeking that money to spend on that. I hope that's not the case, but we will see once this policy is in place. But I very much welcome um, that the amendments which I brought forward around reporting as well um, have been accepted and taken forward by the government. Thank you. And I call on the Minister to wind up. Um, only to say thank you very much to Mr Briggs for his constructive engagement and other members and businesses directly and business representative organisations in developing this proposal and again would encourage all members to support the relevant amendments. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And we move to Group 6, Visitor Levy Scheme Objectives, Coming into Force and Modifications. I call Amendment 34 in the name of Ross Greer, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. And I remind members that amendments 47 and 48 are direct alternatives. That is, they can both be moved and decided on. The text of whichever is the last agreed to is what will appear in the bill. I call Ross Greer to move Amendment 34 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, 
My amendment uh, 34, which I, I move in starting this group, replicates the language used in the workplace parking levy provision of the Transport Act 2019, and it follows the principle that I was arguing uh, for in group 4. This is a local tax, and it should be down to the judgment of a local authority, local elected members, as my colleague Ariane Burgess has just mentioned, uh, to decide if spending is within scope. I move Amendment 34 to provide clarity over the authority that local councils have to make these decisions, and I believe that if passed, if included in the bill, that would reduce the risk of legal challenge by those who believe that councils have taken decisions that are out with scope. Amendments 47 and 48. Uh, replicate the uh, comments made by COSLA that I think uh, were titled something along the lines of let councils get on with it in their briefing for today's debate. They reflect the fact that there are some local authorities who have already put a substantial amount of work uh, into developing potential visitor levy schemes, Edinburgh, Highland and Glasgow being the, the most obvious examples, uh, and that the 18-month lead-in time is simply uh, too long. Uh, that some local authorities have already done months or even uh, years of engagement and development work on that. As the President Officer uh, has mentioned, these are alternatives. Uh, the Green Group's preference would be for a six-month rather than 18-month introductory uh, time, but we have offered a 12-month alternative as a, a compromise arrangement if Parliament uh, is not inclined to agree to six months but does agree that 18 months is perhaps too long. Um, we will oppose Amendments uh, 9 and 10 uh, because they delay the point at which that time period, what is currently 18 months, can start. They uh, delay it to the point of the publication of the final version of a local authority scheme. And we believe that that uh, lead-in time, that what is currently 18 months, should be able to run in parallel with that development process, i.e. that the uh, countdown can start earlier in the process than the publication of the final version of the scheme. Uh, Amendment 9 also introduces that 18-month requirement for significant modification of the scheme, which we uh, do not believe is necessary. Uh, amendments uh, 49 and 50 um, clarify, particularly for those, as I mentioned, local authorities like Edinburgh, Highland uh, and Glasgow, uh, who have already done that work right now, um, that they can essentially uh, count backwards uh, to begin that, whether it is 18 months or whatever Parliament is about to agree to, to begin that timescale, uh, to reflect the, the work already. Uh, done. So they uh, reflect either the date at which the bill was introduced to Parliament, so that is Amendment 49, would say that uh, the 18 month uh, period could have uh, been counted as beginning at that point if local authorities started doing the work then, uh, or in the case of Amendment 50, it would be the point at which uh, the bill is given royal assent and becomes an act, i.e., uh, it can start before the regulations, the secondary legislation that will be required to enact much of the bill. Now, clearly, uh, local levy will not actually be able to come in until we have that secondary legislation passed by Parliament. The purpose of these amendments is to allow local authorities to, in the words of COSLA, get on with it, uh, because some local authorities are simply champing at the bit uh, to introduce these schemes. The revenue from them would be of huge value to the local community, to the visitor economy and, of course, uh, to visitors themselves. We want to see as few barriers in their way as possible, and we want to recognise the work that local authorities like, as I mentioned, Edinburgh, Highland and Glasgow have already done to engage with their local communities, to engage with local businesses and to make sure that they are in a position to introduce these schemes as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Minister to speak to Amendment 7 and other amendments in the group. Presiding officer, this is a, a fairly large group of amendments, many of which interrelate, so I will cover them in the most logical order I can. The objective and use of funding raised by a visitor levy scheme has been a consistent focus throughout the Bill's passage. The objectives of a visitor levy scheme must be and must relate to developing, supporting or sustaining facilities or services which are substantially for or used by people visiting an area for leisure or business purposes, or both. Amendment 34 from Ross Greer seeks to make, that, make this a subjective test, effectively decided by a local authority. And while I, I respect and, and appreciate the arguments that Mr Greer makes, in my view, this would cut across the point of having a clear test in the bill, and the government, therefore, does not support the amendment. Turning to the issue of modifying scheme amendments, it's a scheme. Amendments 9 and 10 reflect the discussions I have had with stakeholders about when the 18-month implement, implementation period should apply. The government's, government's position is that the 18-month implementation period should apply when a visitor levy scheme is introduced or undergoes a significant modification. 
Amendment 9 clarifies this in the Bill, and Amendment 10 sets out the changes that would be classed as significant modification. These include, include increasing the percentage rate of a levy and expanding the geographical area in which a levy applies. Amendments 11 and 12 allow ministers to make regulations to change the list of significant modifications in the future. This would only be possible after consultation with local authorities and tourism and business stakeholders and the approval of Parliament, and is therefore to be used in the future if necessary. I will briefly touch on Amendment 7, which adds a VL scheme's objective to the required content of a visitor levy scheme. This means that modifying a scheme's objective will require the same consultation as any other modification to a scheme. Rushley has lodged a number of amendments related to when a visitor levy comes into force. The Government continues to believe that there is a strong case for the 18-month implementation period. 18 months provides adequate time for both local authorities and businesses to put in place systems and train staff to effectively collect and administer a levy. 82 per cent of respondents to our public consultation supported a time frame of at least one financial year, following conclusion of consultation and engagement activities. This was also supported by 16 out of the 18 local authorities that responded to the question. A period of 18 months is the recommended time, as suggested by the European Tourism Association. This Parliament is legislating for all 32 local authorities and seeking to put in place a robust bill that will be in place for many years to come. With that perspective, I do not believe it is right to be driven by the current views of any one particular local authority. The Government, therefore, does not support amendments 47 or 48, which seek to reduce the 18-month period. Amendments 49 and 50 both seek to redefine the point at which a local authority can make a decision to introduce a visitor levy scheme. Both, in my view, contradict the clear measured process that the Bill would put in place. In the case of Amendment 49, that could potentially mean a visitor levy was put in place before the end of this year. That is something that would cause substantial concern and problems for accommodation providers and the tourism, the tourism industry in general. The Government does not support either of these amendments. I can, however, assure Ross Greer that the Government's intention is to follow the usual timescales in commencing the Bill and bringing it into force. We want local government to have these powers, hence we have introduced this bill and I have guided it through Parliament. But I am not prepared to shortcut a thorough process of consultation and implementation, which will make time for all voices to be heard and businesses and local authorities to efficiently implement a visitor levy. For these reasons, I ask members to support the government amendments in this group. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Presiding Officer. It is un undoubtedly true there are local authorities that are, as Ross Greer put it, champing at the bit. Those local authorities that experience the highest volumes of tourism, those which also, in turn, experience some of the highest costs. And the, the visitors' levy will undoubtedly make a big difference in order to do that. And it's because of that desire my colleague Sarah Boyack brought forward amendments at stage two. However, I think we also do need to consider uh, the, the, the time required by businesses, especially some small businesses, to prepare for this change. Uh, as someone that has had to implement uh, changes um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, imposed by government, particularly around VAT changes in uh, uh, till point systems, it's not always easy or straightforward. And I would also, and I don't mean to, to, to make a, 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 a difficult point here because I'm trying to be constructive, we have recent experience in this place when uh, 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 changes to regulation or requirements have been introduced, perhaps without adequate timelines, and that has caused uh, controversy. And I think it's only right for something, a measure such as this, that we, we take our time and strike that balance between the needs of local authorities and uh, 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 local businesses. The other observation I would make as a, a former retailer, it's not exactly the same thing as running a, a accommodation, but it has its parallels, is as much as the time taken is actually consideration about the point in the year that a levy such as this is introduced by any local authority. What we don't want to see is local authorities introducing a levy at peak season. It would be foolish or, and folly, I would argue, to introduce it in an April, May or June, just as these businesses are hitting peak periods. I would urge local authorities considering these measures to, to do so and introduce them uh, in low season, in January, February 
or, 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 or March. And I just wondered in his concluding remarks if the, the Minister might reflect on those sorts of considerations that local authorities might want to undertake. What, absolutely. Minister. I would just want to, um, to say to Mr Johnson on, on that point, I think it's a very um, important issue um, of ensuring that there can be confidence from businesses and ultimately to realise the potential of the visitor levy to be a force for good and to generate significant revenues for local visitor economies. The administration takes into account and the processes for the administration and the way in which local government takes this forward is built in the most solid foundations of consultation and engagement with business, bringing that lived experience and expertise of business to bear. And that is something we are seeking to capture through the work we are doing on national guidance. And I would want to reassure the Member and Parliament that those issues around implementation and administration is something which will be reflected in the national guidance. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the, the Minister for that intervention. And I, I, can I just say that I think that the approach taken by the Government uh, using the, the vehicle of the statutory guidance uh, and the consultation that they've undertaken with the industry, I think, I think it, it, it strikes the balance that I was alluding to earlier on in my contributions. And I think likewise from the previous section of amendments, I think that the, the forum will enable that dialogue uh, at, at a local level uh, as well. And with that, I would just draw my, my conclusions of this section uh, to a close. I think this is about striking a balance. I, I hear the, the calls from uh, local government. I understand their need, but I also have concerns regarding uh, the ability for, for, for business and giving them adequate time to prepare to implement this, given that they are the ones that are having to administer this levy. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I call Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, as the Minister will be aware from our consideration of this bill, I am very keen to see Edinburgh being able to get on and implement this levy as quickly as possible. And as Daniel Johnson mentioned, I actually raised probing amendments at stage two on this bill, very similar to a couple of those referenced by Ross Greer, in relation to delivering the potential benefits that a visitor levy could deliver in a timely manner. I have listened very carefully to and reflected on the discussion at stage two and the views that we receive from industry. And at the end of the day, I want this levy to work. And a key part of that is making sure that accommodation providers have the time they need to ensure that they're ready to introduce the levy from day one. But at the same time, it's also key that the benefits of this visitor levy are not delayed for too long. I do believe that Edinburgh can move quicker than other local authorities because Edinburgh has been working with local stakeholders on a transient visitor levy for years now. And some of us have actually been involved in discussions about the need for a two-year visitor levy for almost a decade. Uh, I know that the local authority has been following this legislative process in Parliament very closely and that they've already carried out a number of consultations in Edinburgh to get the discussion going on the implementation side of this uh, ambition that we've got. So I was wondering if the Minister would be able to give me a commitment to work closely with the City of Edinburgh Council to ensure that the work it needs to do to meet the consultation requirements set out in the Bill in Section 12 is kept to a minimum as, as is reasonable, so that lessons can be learned from our experience in Edinburgh and that we can get on and join cities and localities right across Europe in introducing a levy. I'd be delighted to take an intervention from the Minister. Minister. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to give um, a commitment that, um, of continued engagement with local authorities, individual local authorities and cause. And I, I recognise the level of ambition in Edinburgh and indeed in Highland and in Glasgow as referenced by Ross Greer and I very much appreciate the desire to, as Cosler put it, just go on with it. As I touched on in my remarks, I think it is important that we remember we are legislating for all 32 local authorities and indeed for a scheme that will be enforced for many, many years to come. But I do remain committed to having constructive engagement both with industry and local government to ensure that as we move forward to implementation, we can do so in as efficient and as effective a way as possible. And with that, in, in that spirit, my door, of course, always remains open to discuss matters with members further. Thank you. Well, that uh, offer to have the door open, that is definitely going to be taken up, Minister. And in fact, it has been useful to be able to meet with yourself and representatives from our council already. I think in some ways, I, I want to sum up here, Edinburgh is almost a pilot because the work has been going on for so long. So it's really crucial in terms of our cultural sector, in terms of the key services that a tourist visitor levy would enable us to deliver, that we're able to get on with it. So I welcome the Minister's constructive comments. I hope we can get 
get this bill through. I hope we can get it uh, implemented in a timely manner and that we don't have to wait too long because, as others have said, uh, there are local authorities champing at the bit, but there's also an awful lot of hard work has already been done in preparation. So I hope we can be constructive and get moving on this. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Liam MacArthur. Thank you, President Officer. I, I, I found the debate on these amendments extremely useful. I think Sarah Boyack's explanation, uh, not just of what Ross Greer was um, talking about in terms of certain local authorities chomping at the bit, but detailing the, the preparatory work that's been ongoing for, for some time. I very much recognise that, not just in Edinburgh, but Glasgow and, of course, uh, Highland Council. But I thought Daniel Johnson made a very, very valid point uh, about the need to strike the balance here. Uh, I think even in those areas where there has been a lot of preparatory work undertaken, second guess what Parliament may do in terms of um, any amendments to, 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 to legislation, even if it's expected to pass, I think would be a dangerous assumption to, to, to make. So I think in the interest of ensuring um, a successful implementation of this, not just in those three council areas um, mentioned, but in the other 29 authorities uh, potentially around the country, taking that additional time, as Daniel Johnson I think was right to point out, is the best way uh, to, to move forward on that basis. Uh, that will be reflected in the way we uh, address the amendments in this group. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Ross Greer to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 34. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I will be pressing Amendment 34. Just in closing, I very much want to associate myself uh, with the remarks of Sarah Boyack. I have got nothing more to add other than uh, to help the clerks. I will not be pressing Amendment 48 if 47 falls, and I will not press Amendment 49 if Amendment 10 passes. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 34 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. Point of order, Christine Graham. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, my phone wouldn't connect. I would have voted no. Thank you, Ms Graham. We'll ensure that's recorded. The result of the vote on amendment number 34 in the name of Ross Greer is yes 25, no 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 7 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 34. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendment 8. In the name of Jeremy Balfour, already debated with Amendment 32. Jeremy Balfour, to move or not move? Uh, move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 35 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs, to move or not move? Uh, moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 35 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. I call Gillian Martin for a point of order. I would have voted no, but my app wasn't working. Thank you, Ms Martin. We'll ensure that's recorded. I call Claire Hawhey for a point of order. Thank you, President Officer. Um, my app hasn't refreshed, so I'm not sure if my vote was cast, but I would have voted no. Thank you. I can confirm your vote was recorded, Ms Hawhey. Thank you. The result of the vote on amendment number 35 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes 49, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 36 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 36 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes 49, no 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 37 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 38 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 39 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 39 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes 48, no 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 40 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 41 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. 
I call Amendment 42 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 43 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 43 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes, 48, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 44 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 45 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not, not move? Moved. I call Amendment 46 in the name of Pam Gossel, already debated with Amendment 32. Pam Gossel to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. No. Okay. I would be grateful if members could ensure that they are calling clearly enough. And the question, therefore, is that Amendment 46 be agreed to. We are not all agreed. Therefore, there will be a division, and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 46 in the name of Pam Gossel is yes, 104, no, 8. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 9 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 34. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number nine in the name of Tom Arthur is yes, 104, no, seven. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 47 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with amendment 34. And I remind members that amendments 47 and 48 are direct alternatives. Ross Greer, to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 47 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 47 in the name of Ross Greer is yes, 7, no, 87. There were 18 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 48 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 34. Ross Greer, to move or not move? Not move, thank you. Thank you. I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 34. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. And the question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 in the name of Tom Arthur is yes, 104, no, 7. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call amendment 49 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with amendment 34. Ross Greer, to move or not move? Not move, thank you. Thank you. I call amendment 50 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with amendment 34. Ross Greer, to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 50 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now.
vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 50 in the name of Ross Greer is yes 7, no 87. There were 18 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call amendment 11 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amendment 34. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 12 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 34. Minister to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call Amendment 51 in the name of Miles Briggs, already debated with Amendment 32. Miles Briggs to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. There will be a division and members should cast their votes now. The vote is closed. The result of the vote on amendment number 51 in the name of Miles Briggs is yes 44, no 68, there were no abstentions, the amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 52 in the name of Pam Gossel, already debated with Amendment 32. Pam Gossel, to move or not move? Not moved. Thank you. I call Amendment 68 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 32. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. I call amendments 13, 14, 15 and 16, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and I invite the Minister to move amendments 13 to 16 on block. Moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 13 to 16? No member objects. Therefore, the question is that amendments 13 to 16 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And we move on to Group 7, Guidance. And I call Amendment 17 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendment 18. Minister to move Amendment 17 and speak to both amendments in the group. Presiding officer, last year the Government asked to visit Scotland to convene an expert group bringing together local government and business to develop guidance and best practice for local authorities considering introducing a visitor levy. To give that guidance a firm status in law, the Government brought forward amendments at stage two, placing a duty on local authorities to have regard to the guidance and requiring Visit Scotland to prepare and publicise the guidance. Following the consideration of some amendments which were discussed but not pressed at stage two, and subsequent discussions with members including Neil Bibby, the Government has now brought forward amendments 17 and 18. Amendment 17 would set out on the face of the bill specific topics that the statutory guidance would need to cover. These include those that local authorities should consult with before introducing a levy, the matters it should consider when deciding the objectives of a visitor levy scheme, and the process to be followed when deciding on local exemptions to a scheme. It also includes guidance on the support or assistance that a local authority may wish to provide to those accommodation providers who will be collecting and remitting a visitor levy. Amendment 18 would allow the list of areas that the guidance must cover to 
be adjusted in the future. These amendments will further strengthen the statutory guidance on the visitor levy. They reflect the views expressed at stage two, and I ask members to support them. I move amendment 17. Thank you, Minister. I, I call Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Um, just briefly to thank uh, the Minister in the absence of my colleague Neil Bibby, who is not in the Chamber today, for um, his work um, to bring forward these amendments that, at Stage 3. Thank you. And I call Ariane Burgess. Uh, thank you. In, in my region, tourism, hospitality and leisure businesses are struggling to recruit the staff needed during the housing emergency. And it's critical for the sector, therefore, that funds raised can be reinvested in affordable housing. At stage two, the minister gave a welcome commitment that local authorities would have the ability to decide for themselves the objectives of a visitor's levy scheme and the way in which uh, the levy proceeds will be spent, including affordable housing and regeneration. And I uh, would seek to confirm from the Minister that any guidance must recognise this discretion and decision-making powers ensuring councils decide their local needs for themselves. Minister, to wind up. Thank you very much, uh, President Office. And I really want to again reiterate my thanks to, to Neil Bibby and other members who have engaged very constructively on this and to provide reassurance to, to Ariane Burge as well. Of course, it will be for a local authority um, implementing the scheme through that process of consultation and engagement with business, tourism organisations and communities to, to determine the aspects of the scheme in around its applicability, duration, percentage rate, and also on what the revenue should be spent. There is a wide range of possibilities, and I touched upon those at stage two in the committee. Um, while it will be for those individual local authorities working in partnership to determine what the optimal use of the revenue would be, I think we can all recognise that there are a range of interventions, some of which can be, some of which could be quite simple and straightforward in improving the appearance of the public realm. Others could be much more significant, for example, around regeneration, de-risking and incentivising opportunities for investment, and particularly in rural contexts where there are real challenges around accommodation for workers and hospitality, helping to address those accommodation challenges as well. So I hope that provides reassurance to the member um, of the wide potential remit of the application of the visitor levy, but of course the key test being, being that it meets what is set out in the bill around supporting the visitor economy. Thank you, Minister. The question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Parliament is agreed. I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Minister, already debated with amend Amendment 17. Minister, to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. We now move to Group 8, Enforcement of the Levy and Penalties. I call Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. I call the Minister to move Amendment 19 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I, I move um, Amendment 19. The amendments in this group all relate to compliance and enforcement, an important part of any tax regime. I should add at the outset that we do not anticipate local authorities will use these powers regularly or often, but it is important that they are there to deal with any situations where there is deliberate evasion or other practices to avoid paying a visitor levy. My Amendment 19 would give ministers the power to make regulations that allow a local authority to substitute their own calculation for that of an accommodation provider. This could only be done in circumstances where the local authority had reason to believe that the le level of levy that someone has reported and returned in their uh, return under Section 23 of the Bill is deliberately or carelessly inaccurate. The power would also allow the regulations to provide that an authority may make an assessment where no return has been made. This amendment would therefore provide local authorities with another tool that could be used in these situations and potentially avoid the need to apply penalties to an accommodation provider. Um, turning to the amendments in the name of Ross Greer, 50 through, um, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 50, uh, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63 and 64. Um, we all substitute the current penalty levy, level set out in the Bill with the words as determined by a relevant local authority. This would mean that a local authority would, uh, could apply any financial penalty it wished to any failure to comply with the provisions set out in the Bill. I have given careful consideration to these amendments. And I do recognise uh, the intent from Mr Greer is with regards to the fiscal empowerment of local government, recognising that this is a local tax. 
And given the government's commitments to work constructively with local government and the development of a fiscal framework and further fiscal empowerment, I'm happy to say to Mr Gray that the government will support these amendments. Given, yes, certainly. Rachel Hamilton. In, uh, I thank Tom Arthur for taking the intervention. Um, what happens if a local authority gets something wrong in terms of their calculation? Do they get a sanction as well? Oh, and can I just register my interest as a, a director of a small hospitality business? Minister. Well, as, as the member will, will appreciate, as, as public bodies, um, local authorities, like any other, are subject to the law, and they have to operate within the terms of this Act, as decided by Parliament. And where there are issues that arise, um, interested parties have the usual members to seek um, um, to address those issues. Um, what I would say is in, in recognising the, uh, the provisions that would come forth from uh, Mr Greer's amendments, which I have previously spoken to, I recognise it will be important um, to consider these matters as well through guidance. So I would want to follow up, um, should these amendments be agreed to by Parliament, uh, to engage with the expert group to ensure that particular issues around penalties are covered as part of the guidance to help ensure local government can take an informed approach. I hope with regards to the commitments that I have made with, um, with these amendments that Mr Greer may consider whether or not amendments 65 and 66 are necessary, given that they would seek to add a surcharge, but given the commitment of the government to support his other amendments, which would enable greater flexibility and fiscal empowerment for local government, the government do not believe these further amendments are necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, I call Ross Greer to speak to Amendment 53 and other amendments in the group. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I should uh, say from the offset that the Greens will support Amendment 19 in the name of the Minister. I think that is a, a very sensible addition to the Bill. Um, and my intention is to move Amendments 53 to 64 on block, because I believe that uh, whether members are voting for or against any one of the amendments, I presume they would be voting for or against all of them. Uh, hopefully, uh, the Parliament will agree to move them on block and we will get uh, out of here 10, 15 minutes earlier. Um, and I welcome very much the, the Minister's commitment that the Government will support these amendments. It is consistent with the principle that I have outlined uh, throughout this afternoon, um, that we are giving new financial powers to local government, uh, and I therefore do not believe that we should be micromanaging how they exercise those powers. Uh, personally, I think that local variation makes complete sense, particularly given the relative value, turnover, room rate, etc., between average operators in different areas of the country. And as the Minister said, I think this approach would be consistent with the Scottish Government's wider approach to devolving fees and charges. For example, the current consultation on planning fees, I think this would be very much in line with that. Um, there is also it's a small point, but it is one worth making. It avoids adding uh, further uh, to Parliament's workload, because any uh, penalty rates that we set in primary legislation, Parliament will need to come back to in the future to adjust, most obviously, in, in line with inflation. That either adds to Parliament's workload or it results in some areas of fees, charges, penalty rates, etc., simply uh, not being updated for quite some time. For example, I think we are about to come up on a decade since the last time uh, the final issued by SEPA uh, were updated. Some of them are now uh, considerably devalued by the impact of inflation since they were initially set. I very much welcome the, the Minister's comments in relation to guidance. I do think national guidance is important in this area, sitting alongside that local discretion. I want to outline the, the principle behind Amendments 65 and, and 66, so I will address the, uh, the request the Minister made um, in, in closing. 65 and 66 do the, the same thing. Um, either 65 would be a local power, 66 it would be national. What they do is they would create a multiplier uh, effect, a multiplier power uh, akin to that which is in uh, place already for low emission zones. Uh, and that would be that if an operator were repeatedly in breach and were repeatedly issued with a fine, that the level of that fine would increase with the number of occasions in which they had been in breach. The, the logic is the same as that for the low emission zone. We should never be in a position where the fine is simply seen as the cost of doing business and a hit uh, worth taking. I would hope that it would never be required. The thinking behind it, though, is that if you do have particular businesses who are behaving in such a way, and a local authority were considering raising their fines to act as a disincentive, I do not think other businesses who may have made an honest mistake one year and be eligible for a penalty I do not think they should have to pay a higher penalty because the local authority is trying to deter those who are repeat offenders. So that is the, the logic behind that. Though I hear what the, the Minister has um, got to say, and I, I would not be minded uh, to press those given the Government's uh, agreement to my block of amendments uh, 53 to 64. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Crew. And I would ask whether the Minister wishes to add anything by way of wind up. Um, just to um, again thank Mr Greer for bringing forward um, those um, amendments which um, uh, the government has agreed to support. I do think they uh, speak to a shared agenda across the Parliament of the fiscal empowerment of local government. I, and while I, I recognise the um, intent behind uh, Amendments 65 and 66, the government would not be able to support them at, at this stage uh, where Mr Greer to um, press them. But I think more broadly in considering the uh, suite of powers around uh, penalties, fees, fines and levies, etc. that are available for local government, that is something that can feed into that broader piece of work which I know we are um, committed to taking forward in a, a spirit of partnership. Thank you, Minister. Uh, the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I now call Amendments 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63 and 64, all in the name of Ross Greer and all previously debated. I invite Ross Greer to move Amendments 53 to 64 en bloc. Moved on bloc, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 53 to 64? No member objects. The question is, therefore, that amendments 53 to 64 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is agreed. I call amendment 65 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with uh, amendment 19. Ross Greer to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. I call Amendment 66 in the name of Ross Greer, already debated with Amendment 19. Ross Greer to move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. We now turn to uh, Group 9, Report on Operation of Act. I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Minister in a group of its own, and the Minister is to move and speak to Amendment 20. Presiding officer, evaluation of the bill had been raised during its passage, including by the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee at Stage 1 and by Miles Briggs at Stage 2. The Government has considered that aspect and therefore brought forward Amendment 20. This Amendment 20 would put in place a requirement for the Scottish Government to review the operation of the bill and prepare a report of that review. The review would be required to cover several areas that have been raised by members during the passage of the bill. These include the impact of visitor levy schemes on business and communities, how net proceeds of schemes have been used and any exemptions from paying a visitor levy. Evaluations of the laws we pass and their operation in practice is an important part of good policy making and I hope members will be able to support uh, this important provision and I hope it provides some reassurance to Mr Briggs that while I was not able to support any of his amendments directly, his impact has been felt on this bill and the amendments the Government has brought forward. And in that I move Amendment 20. Thank you, Minister. The question is uh, that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. We now move to Group 10 on commencement. I call Amendment 67 in the name of Ross Greer in a group on its own, and I call Ross Greer to uh, move and to speak to Amendment 67. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This will be a, a short contribution. Amendment 67 simply compels the Government to bring in the regulations that are required for a local authority to actually end up in a place where it is operating a visitor levy within six months of royal assent. Uh, but the consequence for not doing so is simply that they would have to uh, report the reason why to Parliament. It's just a, it's a bit of a, a stick rather than a carrot, but a very light stick to encourage the Government to make sure that there is appropriate parliamentary accountability if they are in the situation where the regulations cannot be brought forward within six months. Thank you, uh, Mr Greer. I call the Minister. President Officer, Amendment 67 by Ross Greer, as we have heard, seeks to require ministers to make regulations commencing the whole bill within six months of the bill receiving royal assent. But it seems to recognise the need for some flexibility by saying that if they do not do so, they would have to report their reasons to Parliament. As members will know, it is a convention that a bill is not commenced until at least two months after royal assent, and the government sees no reason not to follow that in this case. As regards the period after that, the amendment itself anticipates the commencing of the whole bill within six months might not be possible, as it allows for a report to be made if that happens. I do not think that this extra process is appropriate for the face of the bill, as it introduces uncertainty and does not make clear what would happen after that. As I outlined earlier, the government is committed um, to commencing this bill in line with the usual timescales. 
proposed. It is important that the usual time and flexibility is provided for bringing the bill into force, and I do not want to shortcut or change the usual processes. So, therefore, while I ask members not to support this amendment, I do want to provide uh, the most sincere reassurance to Mr Greer and to members across the, uh, the Chamber uh, the Government will not be tardy in getting on with ensuring that this bill um, is fully commenced, recognising the significant appetite that exists amongst our local authorities to get on with it. And I call on Ross Grew to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 67. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, given the Minister's remarks and also I think the very high level of engagement myself, all other opposition parties and key stakeholders have had from the Ministers on this bill, I would be happy on the basis of what he's just said uh, not to press this amendment. Okay, uh, the amendment uh, is not to be pressed. That ends consideration of amendments. And as members will be aware, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of a bill relates to a protected subject matter. That is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this bill, in my view, no provision of the Visitor Levy Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill uh, does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. And before we move on to the debate, I call on Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson to signify Crown consent to the bill. For the purposes of Rule 9.11 of the Standing Orders, I advise the Parliament that His Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the Visitor Levy Scotland Bill, has consented to place his prerogative and interests insofar as they are affected by the Bill at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So the next item of business is a debate on Motion uh, 13349 in the name of Tom Arthur on Visitor Levy Scotland Bill at Stage 3. I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Minister Tom Arthur to speak to and to move the motion up to seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Before I turn to the content of the bill itself, I want to thank members for the thoughtful and constructive way many of them have engaged with it as it has progressed through Parliament. Members have put forward their views and arguments in a measured way, both in committee, the Chamber and in my own individual meetings with them. I believe that the scrutiny process has improved the bill and shown the Parliament in a good light. On the substance of the bill, I strongly believe that a visitor levy can be a force for good. It is a measure that can bring benefits to visitors, residents and businesses. It has the potential to be an important tool, enabling investment in the local economy and supporting an important industry in Scotland. Visitor levies are common in many parts of the world, but I am proud that, if passed, this bill will create the opportunity for the first true visitor levy in the UK. 21 European countries have some kind of visitor levy, and I believe that it is right that Scotland has the ability to add to that number. The measures in the bill reflect good practice from around the world and their own particular context in Scotland. I will turn to each of the features of international good practice as highlighted by the European Tourism Association in turn and discuss them in relation to the bill. The first important factor is that genuine, effective local consultation is carried out before any visitor levy is introduced. The bill will therefore require local consultation before introducing or modifying a visitor levy scheme. That consultation must involve communities, businesses engaged in tourism and local tourist organisations. Furthermore, we have considered today amendments that would strengthen that ongoing consultation and engagement with the creation of a visitor levy forum. Another element that is highlighted as good practice internationally is for it to be clear and transparent where funding raised by a visitor levy is being used. We know from our own consultation and engagement that it is also important to the tourism industry here in Scotland. The Bill therefore puts in place clear parameters around how the funding raised by a levy is used. As members will know, the funding can only be used to develop, support or sustain facilities or services which are substantially for or used by those visiting an area for leisure or business purposes. That definition was adjusted as, as the Bill moved through Parliament, recognising the views of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee at Stage 1, another example of where the scrutiny process has improved the Bill. That position on funding gives local authorities the flexibility to use the funding raised by a levy in the best way that supports the visitor economy in their area. 
For example, that could include street dressing or promotion of a particular destination. It could support housing for such housing is necessary to address recruitment and retention issues in the tourism sector. It could uh, include investing in regeneration work and what is required to facilitate investment by the private sector in a new hotel or tourist attraction. The Government has purposefully not specified exactly how the funding should be used. What we have sought to do in the Bill is put in place a structure and process that means, within broad parameters, decisions can be made locally that support the local economy. A suitable notice period for the introduction of or changes to a visitor levy is another feature of international good practice. That also reflects the strongly held position of business in Scotland. That is why the Government has consistently said that a suitable length of implementation period is necessary to give businesses and local authorities time to prepare their systems, train staff and carry out other necessary preparations. Lastly, in terms of good practice internationally, any visitor levy should be easy to pay, collect and remit. The Bill therefore puts in place a robust process with a suitable level of local discretion for collecting and remitting a visitor levy. The calculation of the visitor levy is straightforward and importantly reflects the cost of the accommodation a visitor has decided to book. The Bill also puts in place a clear process for any compliance and enforcement action. We do not expect such tools to be used often. However, it is important they are there to provide local authorities with what they need to address actions by those who, for example, deliberately seek to avoid a visitor levy. The Bill, of course, will not stand alone. Last year, I asked Visit Scotland to convene an expert group and invited local government and business organisations to sit on it. That group's purpose is to develop guidance for local authorities seeking to introduce a visitor levy in their area. Certainly. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful uh, to the Minister for giving me, and uh, uh, as per uh, our interactions uh, with the passage of the amendments, I, I think this group is a, a good way of striking the balance. I just wonder what will happen to this group uh, once the, the guidance is drawn up and whether there is a view from the government as to whether it needs to have a, 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 some sort of standing basis or whether it will be incorporated in other uh, industry engagement that the government will, will seek to do on an ongoing basis. Minister. I think there is a, a need for ongoing engagement, and I think the point that Mr Johnson um, raises speaks to, the, speaks to the importance not only of the review period within individual local authorities, but now, as agreed by Parliament and amendments to the Bill, the review period for the legislation as a whole. So I think it, we will have these clear points, these clear milestones of review, both locally and nationally, to consider. Um, how visitor levy schemes are operating individually and cumulat cumulatively, which will provide that opportunity for considering any refreshing of the guidance and updates that are required. But I agree as well, continued dialogue between local government and the tourism sector, as provided for in the legislation, is important, but of course through government as well, and giving some of the existing structures we have in government through, for example, industry leadership groups, etc. There are suitable forums there which will allow industry to feed back, as well as allowing local government to feed back to government through the regular dialogue that takes place. Yes, certainly. Paul Sweeney. Thank the, Minister for, thank the Minister for giving way. Um, I was just curious as to whether the funds raised through the levy would have to be spent in the given financial year or whether there could be a scope for a sinking fund to enable larger capital investments to be made part as a multi-year programme. Um, just whether that has been given consideration. Minister. The the scheme sets out very clear requirements about objectives and very clear reporting requirements, including the separate accounting of the levy raised. One of the things that is important, I think, in this scheme for it to be successful is to recognise that there are a range of projects which could benefit from the investment. Some could be, require revenue, relatively low levels of investment, but others, I think, as a member alludes to, could require significantly more. So we are keen to ensure that flexibility is there for local authorities to apply revenue generated from the levy in a way that is they see fit, but is of course consistent with the engagement and consultation they have had and ongoing engagement they have with business, tourism organisations and communities in their area. Presiding officer, just turning back to the guidance, over the last months um, the expert group has worked to bring together guidance that draws on the knowledge and experience of the tourism sector and local government. That guidance will, as a result of the scrutiny of the bill at stage two, as I have said, be on a statutory footing. It is a key element in getting a visitor levy right for Scotland, and I want to put on record my thanks to those who sit on the expert group or otherwise support its work. Presiding officer, as I said at the start of my remarks, this bill is an important measure. If passed, it will give local authorities a 
significant new tax power. That is not something that the government has proposed lightly, and it follows considerable engagement and discussion over many years. In the bill, the government has sought to strike the right balance between national consistency and local flexibility. I believe we have struck the right balance. I welcome the improvements to the bill that have come about from engagement and amendment, and I ask that the Parliament supports it. Uh, Minister, could I ask you to formally move the I move the bill. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. I now call on Miles Briggs to open on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to six minutes, please, Mr uh, Briggs. Th thank you, Deputy uh, Presiding Officer. And can I uh, start by thanking uh, the Parliament clerks for the support that they've provided during the passage of the bill. Maybe it hasn't been as successful today as I had hoped, uh, but the many organisations and businesses and councils that have also, also engaged with um, Parliament and committee as the bill's made its way to stage three. And can I start on a positive note um, by welcoming the fact that the Minister has accepted the arguments I put forward at Local Government Committee around excluding children and young people, and also welcome the amendments which the Government have brought forward um, following my amendments at stage two around business involvement, the creation of the Visitor Levy Forum, and also the review on the impacts of the bill in the future. And I very much welcome the inclusion of the amendments um, in the name of my colleagues, uh, Jeremy Balfour, and also Pangozal, uh, which have been accepted uh, today. For the estimated two to 3,000 small businesses that do have an annual turnover below the, that, that threshold that the bill will have, I hope they will see an exemption. Um, this has been a significant concern for small businesses, and I would pay tribute to the work of uh, the Scottish Federation of Small Businesses, Association of Scottish Self-Caterers, Scottish Tourism Alliance and Scottish B&B Association, as well as uh, Scottish Land and Estates for their constructive work to see these amendments uh, delivered that will help, I hope, protect small businesses uh, from the impact of the bill. The legislation has once again, though, been taken forward by ministers as a framework bill. Um, and as, a, as has been raised with other bills, this does present a number of concerns and challenges and issues relating to the implementation and variation uh, this, this legislation could ultimately produce across Scotland. I fear that ministers have not taken on board the wa warnings and lessons from the disastrous implementation of the short-term let's licensing legislation and the negative impact which that, this continues to have on small businesses. The fra fragmentation, inconsistency and often disproportionate costs which implementation of the policy has seen. For many accommodation businesses across Scotland, they feel that they have been under consistent bombardment from the SNP and Green Ministers, which has negatively impacted on their businesses and has seen many businesses lost in Scotland as well. Indeed, uh, evidence from the Scottish B&B Association today suggests that 67% of their members say that the actual costs of the SNP licence uh, S TL licensing to them has impacted on their business uh, revenue and also affected their viability as businesses. Deputy President Officer, I am concerned though that ministers have failed to develop a robust exemption scheme on the face of the bill. My amendments today would uh, have helped to deliver that. And I do think we will look uh, back at this um, and, and, not, uh, and not be happy that these weren't taken forward. I don't believe that Parliament uh, should hope that the government will take forward um, statutory guidance um, and that all 32 councils, if they all decide to implement a visitor levy, will then take forward um, the set of amendments, which, uh, exemptions, which will deliver. I am concerned, for example, that we could see a situation um, when this is left to each council to decide on local exemp exemptions, for argument's sake, that we could see parents forced to stay in hotels whilst visiting their children who are receiving short treatment here at the Sick Kids in Edinburgh, forced to pay a visitor levy. But families in Glasgow whose children are receiving treatment at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital uh, would not. Now, I don't think that's acceptable. I don't think anyone uh, in Parliament would say uh, to their constituents that that is acceptable. But we have failed to act and put that exemption in the bill today. And, and I'm disappointed that um, has, has not been seen. Likewise, um, for members represent, representing islands, so often uh, family members will uh, accompany um, friends and family to hospital for that treatment to support them. Um, for example, people coming from Orkney to, to Aberdeen, uh, to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, they will be paying a tourist tax uh, to stay in accommodation there, which I think is wrong. So I do um, hope that the Minister will really pay um, 
attention to how that is taken forward and what exemptions could still be brought together in the guidance, in the statutory guidance. Um, we should rightly be proud and celebrate our outstanding tourism sector in Scotland. The visitor offer that tourism businesses across Scotland provide is world class and the importance to our local and national economy is significant and mu must never be underestimated or undervalued. Tourism, and indeed the estimate, it's estimated that it's worth £4.5 billion pounds to the Scottish economy, is critical and directly import, it supports more than 250,000 jobs across our country, importantly in some of the most economically vulnerable rural and island communities. However, we have heard that many in parts of the country uh, where businesses um, still do not feel that they have recovered from the pandemic, uh, that this will be another impact. And Scottish Conservatives have said um, that at the heart of a visitor levy um, needs to be more uh, to develop funds for the investment and improvement of our tourism sector, not simply looking towards this as being a revenue stream for councils. Um, and that's something which I, I think when the, this comes into force, we will just have to see whether or not uh, councils are forced to look towards filling voids in their funding uh, with this. What is important, that, and I hope councils do uh, consider this, is they don't see this new power as simply a golden goose in return to make up for funding cuts uh, which have come from the Scottish Government. I also want to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, we do not see monies raised in this then taken away under for funding formulas are also cuts uh, to culture budgets. I don't know if I will have any Briefly, Mr Carson. Yeah. Uh, thank you for taking the intervention. You, you want, uh, uh, the constituency businesses like I've got Loch Ken, Auchinlary, Brickhouse Bay, Caravan Park, all provide a very low impact in the environment and in the local, local uh, communities uh, by offering cheap uh, camping holidays uh, and also the caravan and camping clubs that uh, offer low impact uh, holidays that this, this could actually given they have not recovered from uh, COVID uh, have a real impact on them going forward Most please why I brought forward a, a set of amendments um, working with the caravan and camping sector who, who wanted to make sure that they potentially will not be impacted by this. Again, the statutory and, uh, guidance which the Minister will be taking forward, I think, hopefully can have an opportunity to look at some of that and include that uh, going forward, especially those businesses where this isn't the main uh, source of income. And, and for those council areas which may actually look like Edinburgh, I think I've suggested that they may exempt camping and, and camping sites uh, as well. Um, I do not believe, though, that the Scottish public necessarily have truly inf been informed on the impact that this will have on them and perhaps that's why ministers were so keen that this doesn't come into force before the 2026 council uh, Holyrood elections uh, because for most Scots this isn't about visitors this is about them this is about the fact that they will be paying 10 percent additional cost to stay in a hotel when their house is flooded that potentially that this uh, when they are going to hospital with their children they'll be paying this tax because we have no exemptions and I think for many people uh, when they see that uh, they will question why Parliament has not brought forward exemptions. Uh, to conclude, as things stand, there remains significant vacuum in many aspects of the Bill, with Ministers insisting that statutory guidance will provide the clarification to help the accommodation sector to limit the costs and negative impacts the Bill will have on their businesses. Um, we have not seen that, uh, but we are desperate to see what that will look like, and as I hope the sector will help uh, to work to define that. Our Scottish tourism sector already faces the highest tax burden amongst any in the world. Scottish Conservatives, therefore, will not be supporting the introduction of this bill at decision time. Throughout the passage of the bill, we have worked constructively and tried to work hard to improve the legislation, though, and have worked with the Minister to try to see where limits can be put and the negative impacts addressed. Mr. Briggs, I will have to ask you to vulnerable. conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Briggs. I now call on Mark Griffin or to open on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee, the, the Minister and his Bill team, the Parliament's Legislation team, uh, and all of the organisations that have given evidence um, on the Bill for um, shaping the Bill that we have um, in front of us tonight. For the best part of a, a decade, we in Scottish Labour have called for a, a visitor levy. We are pleased to see that the Scottish Government have listened and are happy to support the passage of the Bill through Stage 3. Local authorities should have as much control as possible over the implementation of the levy, levy simply because this reflects 
um, our commitment to push power out to local communities. The visitor levy is a particularly good example of where this approach works because of the diversity of Scotland's tourism sector. Some authorities are much more frequently visited than others um, who are likely to see potentially negligible returns um, from any levy. We welcome the flexibilities within the bill which allow councils to implement a levy if they so choose and design it in a way that suits local circumstances, of course, in consultation with relevant stakeholders. Now, throughout its passage, the committee and other interested parties have attempted to balance support for local government while maintaining economic growth and supporting sustainable tourism. And it's clear that the, the tourism and hospitality sector have faced significant difficulties over recent years, the COVID-19 pandemic, the associated lockdowns and the subsequent cost of living crisis. But the committee did come to the view that a levy would be unlikely to deter visitors. We agreed that a small additional fee on top of accommodation costs is seen as part of the normal tourist experience in many other countries and can help to ameliorate the potential negative consequences for communities when tourism becomes unsustainable. And while we support the levy, um, we also say that, that implementation must not place too great a burden on businesses or local authorities. We are particularly keen to ensure that smaller businesses are not disproportionately affected by the application of, of any future levies decided locally. But the levy will be a, a shot in the arm to hard-pressed local authorities who are struggling right now with the pressure on local services brought about by large numbers of visitors. But revenue, crucially, must not be used to replace funding for core local services. Because for over a decade, Scot Scottish local authorities have seen their budgets stripped to the bone. Well, that's left libraries closed, rubbish uncollected, and some of our most vulnerable people's services shut down and never reopened. It can't be a substitute for a reduction in the general revenue grant to local authorities, and it can't be about plugging a, a gap. Accounts Commission figures show that between 2011 to 2021-2022, revenue expenditure on culture and leisure fell by 23.6%, spending on roads dropped by 16.1%, and environmental services by 12.8%. Now, in the face of these swinging cuts presided over by this government, any revenue that is raised must be used to improve the tourism offer and the services that tourists appreciate and visit Scotland for. And this levy, while well welcome, will not touch the size of the £6 billion plaque hole the Government have created in local budgets, and the Government can't pretend it will act as a replacement for the fair core funding settlement that communities need. We have a different vision for local government, one which will guarantee fair funding settlements and protect vital local decision making, so local people have I see over the services which affect their day-to-day -day lives um, most. We also see tourism as a key part of our uh, wider business case for Scotland, uh, where it encourages economic growth through the promotion of Brand Scotland and making sure our country becomes a vital destination for business and leisure travellers. The visitor levy forms a, a key part of our um, commitment to implementing a new tourism strategy that builds cultural links with key markets and developing Brand Scotland's reputation on a global stage. Now, we have uh, proposed similar levies in previous manifestos. We have identified that it could be a key part of the fiscal framework and for the democratic accountability of local authorities. Uh, and for those reasons, President Officer, we are supporting the bill at decision time tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Griffin. I now call on Ariane Burgess to open on behalf of the Scottish Greens. Up to four minutes, please, Ms Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to um, start by thanking the Parliament clerks, the clerks at Local Government Housing and Planning Committee, the Bill team, and all the stakeholders that joined us to help shape this bill. And uh, it's also bringing back uh, memories of visits to Orkney Island Council and also to Abbey Moor, where we spoke with Highland Council, as well as other stakeholders. The Scottish Greens are pleased to see the visitor levy bill come to its final stage today and having secured it, having secured it 
during budget negotiations back in 2019. This approach to capturing for communities the benefits of Scotland's global appeal has been the norm across many of the world's top tourist destinations for a long time. It's been the long-standing position of the Scottish Greens that councils should have greater financial powers to raise their own revenues, as opposed to the current position, where around two-thirds of their budget comes from the Scottish Government grant. And we have some of the most centralised and least empowered local government on our continent, but that is gradually changing. The visitor's levy power is an important part of a much wider set of empowerment measures, and it must be joined by a cruise ship levy, a move which will be a particular benefit to Ireland councils in my region and was announced by the Greens last year as soon as possible. Green's proposals for a cruise ship levy are linked to emissions, so the biggest, most polluting boats pay more. Our island constituents deserve us to fully consider all these issues, and that can only be done through a standalone piece of legislation. We're incredibly fortunate that Scotland is such an attractive destination for visitors, whether from abroad, from the rest of the UK, or our own residents choosing to explore and enjoy their own country for their holidays. For no, for for nowhere is that more true than in my region, from Shetland to Speyside and Skye to the Small Isles. That's great for our economy, especially in fragile rural communities, but it also puts huge pressure on rural communities, the natural environment, and on public services. Rarely does a summer season go by without local and often national headlines about inconsiderate or even dangerous parking, antisocial behaviour, and litter on the North Coast 500. Clearly, that's from a small minority of visitors, not all of whom will be staying overnight. But it does put pressure on council services, and it's only fair that local residents aren't picking up the bill. Tax is one way in which we all contribute to building a better world for our communities. I'm proud that the Scottish Greens are honest about the need for a fairer tax system if we want better public services. And we've already secured big changes, raising income tax on the highest earners, raising tax on the purchase of second and holiday homes, doubling council tax on those holiday homes, and the increasing range of new local powers like the visitor levy, the cruise ship levy to come, and the infrastructure levy on big uh, developers. By diversifying our, ta diversifying our tax base, we can empower communities to de deliver on their local priorities and have real control. Presiding officer, um, there's a few themes from the evidence I've heard during the progress of the bill I'd like to highlight. Um, the, uh, the first is around the 18-month gap uh, before a scheme can be introduced. And COSLA did make it clear that this is clearly both proportionate and excessive, and I think we need to reflect on that. The second is the scope for spending the funds raised. Many hospitality businesses in rural communities are struggling to uh, fill vacancies caused in, uh, in large part by local housing shortages. And during the committee, as I mentioned earlier, during the committee debate on stage two of the bill, the minister was clear that the funds raised through the levy could be spent on housing and regeneration, both uh, of which support the wider economy that the tourism industry rely on. It's vital that councils retain the flexibility to do this, and I remind the Minister of his words that local authorities will want to use the funding in a way that best supports their local visitor economy, and that those supports could include relevant regeneration and potentially supporting affordable housing projects. This is just one of many measures required to empower uh, local councils, but it is one that the Scottish Greens are proud to support. Thank you, Ms Burgess. And I now call on uh, Liam MacArthur to open on behalf of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Up to four minutes, please, Mr MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I join others in thanking the Local Government Committee uh, and indeed all those uh, that gave uh, evidence, including uh, those in, in Orkney. And again, again, I pay tribute to the Local Government Committee for taking the time to visit the islands. I, I think the principle underlying um, this uh, bill is one that we broadly uh, support in empowering local authorities uh, to take steps to meet the challenges that they face. I think earlier, in relation to the amendments, we heard on the one hand certain local authorities um, chomping at the, the bit. I think it would be a, a mischaracterisation to assume that all local authorities find themselves in that position. But at the same time, I think we also need to acknowledge that, uh, far from chomping at the bit, there are many businesses within the, within the tourism sector 
who have uh, approached this debate with some uh, apprehension. Uh, we've heard um, earlier from Miles Briggs about the, the views expressed by the Federation of Small Businesses, the Association of uh, Scottish Self-Catering um, uh, Businesses. All, all of these, I think, have been quite rightly highlighting concerns that I'm picking up locally and I think are being felt uh, nationally as well. This, part of this is about the uncertainty, part of it is uh, a reflection of cumulative effect, um, whether that's to do with the short-term lets legislation, whether it's the broader cost of living um, crisis or indeed the aftermath of COVID. I think it's absolutely right that the Bill has taken an approach um, seeking out flexibility wherever uh, possible, a local determination, recognising that I think the tourism sector looks different in different parts of the country and, as I said earlier, also at different uh, times in the year. But nevertheless, in order, I think, to command the confidence of the sector but also of the wider public, fairness and equity needs to be at the heart of it and it absolutely needs to ensure uh, that it's able uh, to wash its own face. There is no point setting up a system uh, of, of attracting in revenue from a levy uh, that barely covers the cost of administration. And there, I think uh, I would return to the amendments I posed uh, earlier on in proceedings in relation to cruise traffic and, and motorhomes. Uh, I ha happen to believe um, that the development we've seen in, in, in both those aspects of the tourism sector is, is a good and healthy sign, but both, I think, require to be managed. And, and unfortunately, in the legislation as it currently stands, the fact that bed and, uh, bed and breakfast, self-catering and hotels are captured by the levy, but uh, cruise traffic and motorhomes remain out with the ambit of that for reasons I, I, I understand. Um, it is difficult, I think, for many local authorities to see a way of proceeding uh, with it. I think uh, the, exceptions, the exemptions that um, uh, would be delivered, I think, back to that principle of local flexibility. I would maybe disagree with uh, Miles Briggs in that, uh, in that respect. I think those are better determined locally. But I think he was absolutely right to point to the example for, uh, of patients in, in Orkney and in Shetland um, who often will be accessing services within Orkney and within Shetland, and one would assume that any local scheme would exempt them. But very often they are seeking specialist treatment, whether in Aberdeen, Inverness, or even further south. And it's difficult to see how uh, they or uh, patient escorts, etc., would be exempt under uh, schemes operated by other uh, local authorities. I think before closing, could I um, pay tribute to the Minister for the, the characteristically constructive way in which he sought to engage uh, on the issues that I was raising around cruise, uh, uh, cruise liner traffic and, and motorhomes, but uh, clearly, as evidenced through the uh, votes on stage three amendments, the way he's engaged across the parties uh, over stage two and stage three. And I think, as I say, that's entirely uh, characteristic. Um, but I recognise this is legislation that is going to pass uh, this evening. Maybe the concerns I've raised will come to be seen to be misplaced. Uh, but at this stage, given the gaps that there are, uh, the uncertainty there is around um, key issues in the way that this would apply uh, in practice in the uh, islands I represent and, and others. It is not a piece of legislation that, that I or Scottish Liberal Democrats can support. Thank you, Mr MacArthur. We will now move to the open uh, debate. Uh, backbench speeches of up to four minutes. I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Pam Gozo. Mr Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer, and thanks also to my fellow committee members and colleagues for their detailed consideration of the bill. Uh, the Visitor Levy Bill delivers on a commitment made to our local councils to provide them with the power, as requested, to apply a local visitor levy in order to help improve the local tourism economy. That's what it says in the tin, and that's what it does. All the revenue must raised must be reinvested locally in facilities and services in order to enhance the visitor experience whilst benefiting the local community and economy at the same time. Now, the Scottish Government has engaged with many st stakeholders for a number of years now and hopefully tonight Parliament will support the Bill, which will ultimately help to improve the local tourism offer and benefit the local economy too. These type of taxes are commonplace around Europe now and as of the publication date of the Bill, I think 21 out of 27 EU member states charge an occupancy rate of some description or another. Well, I don't expect East Ayrshire to use the bill. Sorry, I've got four minutes. We've probably had enough debate for the day, and I can see members desperate to get, get home. While I don't expect East Ayrshire to use the power presiding officer, I know that many councils are eagerly looking forward to introducing the measure so they, they can improve the offer for the experience of their, the visitors who come to visit them. 
It would be fair to say, though, President Officer, that there were quite a range of opinions in the many, many of the proposals, including whether to apply a flat rate, a percentage rate, a tiered rate, a cap, with a cap, without a cap, what exemptions should apply, how soon could it be introduced, and so on and so on. And we've heard some of that debate replayed today and tonight. There was plenty of debate at whether, about whether a percentage rate was better than a flat rate. And as I recall, the argument that a visitor to a five-star luxury hotel should probably pay a little bit more than a visitor to a small B&B, and that argument, I think, slightly won the day. Um, some, some councils wanted the shorter lead-in time, as we heard during the uh, passing of the uh, amendments and debate on the amendments, given the time that the bill has already been under consideration. But also, as I recall, there seemed to be a preference for an 18-month to 24-month lead-in time to give everybody, everybody enough time to prepare and get ready for the levy being introduced. And that's a period that seems to be in line with advice from the European Tourism Association. Our councils, of course, will, if the bill is introduced, introduced be obliged to consult further with their stakeholders to help shape the levy to fit local needs and circumstances as far as possible. And that, too, is a flexibility that the councils appreciated and was stressed by a number of members around the chamber. Um, the councils can set the levy as a percentage of the accommodation cost, and they can apply it to all or parts of their local area. Um, COSLA's Resources Spokesperson, Councillor Katie Hagman, welcomed the process of the bill, progress of the bill as providing a small but significant step towards maximising the revenue raising powers available to local government. So the councils, as we might expect, will have a crucial next step to play in taking the bill forward. As we know, the government is committed to considering further how to bring cruise ships into the sphere of some local visitor levy, possibly requiring se uh, separate primary legislation to achieve that. Uh, President officer, just our local government committee members gave this bill a really thorough examination. And whilst we couldn't get unanimous agreement on the bill's principles at the committee stages, we did all at least agree that the introduction of a levy at a modest rate would be unlikely to have a significant deterrent effect on visitor numbers, and I think that's worth stating. Uh, with that, President Officer, I'm happy to conclude my remarks and listen to the contributions of other members that remain in the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Coffey. I call Pam Gozel to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Ms. Gozel. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to be contributing to today's Stage 3 debate on the Visitor Levy Bill from the Scottish Conservative benches. I would also like to echo, like earlier, thanking the clerks of the committee for all their hard work and also thanking all the external organisations for providing us briefings for members. The Scottish Conservatives back Scotland's world-leading tourism sector, and that's why I've always been open to hearing how we can best support it. I would like to thank the Minister and majority members across the Chamber for supporting my amendment which would require a visitor levy scheme to specify whether the levy is not payable in relation to accommodation which has an annual turnover below the VAT threshold. I hope it will make some difference in protecting the small and micro businesses. I fully understand the need to empower local authorities, but this should not come at the expense of businesses. I am of the firm belief that tourists and accommodation providers should not be penalised with the ta this tax. Instead, local councils should be provided with a fair funding settlement that fully supports our tourism sector. When I spoke to 31 out of 32 councils in Scotland about this, many were quite frankly desperate to generate additional cash. However, others won't make a penny from it, so we need a sustainable long-term solution. In fact, the levy would negatively impact businesses to the extent it undermines long-term revenues and financial sustainability, from reduced profits to reduced sector growth and therefore reduced tax revenues. The cost of doing business in Scotland is already high and many businesses are still reeling the impact of repeated lockdowns. This is further compounded by the business rates, VAT, stringent regulations on short-term lets and so on. As previously mentioned, there are around 2,000 to 3,000 smaller accommodation providers who are not VAT registered. 
And despite my amendment, a major concern for many will remain being pushed over the VAT threshold by the levy because, anecdotally speaking, the committee heard it can take a 50 per cent increase in turnover just to cover the cost of going over the threshold. So essentially, small businesses, instead of paying VAT because of an increased turnover, would instead pay, be paying VAT for acting as an unpaid tax collector for local councils. This will be a costly and complicated endeavour, particularly for small accommodation providers. Many of these businesses rely on traditional bookkeeping methods using ledgers and diaries rather than sophisticated accounting systems. Implementing and managing the visitor level will impose a significant administrative burden, diverting time and resources away from their core operations. The small accommodation sector runs on tight margins and already faces an endless barge of regulations. Should this bill pass, the Parliament runs a real risk of sinking small businesses to fill the gaping black hole in public finances. I thank members for backing my Stage 3 amendment. However, I cannot support a bill which penalises the tourism sector and hurts businesses. I urge members to protect Scotland's small and micro businesses, which are the backbone of our local economies and communities, by voting against this bill at stage three. In conclusion, presiding officer, I will be voting against the visitor levy bill today. I have persistently made attempts to make this bill as cost neutral to businesses as possible, but I cannot ignore the additional financial burden and the administrative burden this bill will cause, and it remains unclear how it will even be administered. The Scottish Government should not penalise tourists and accommodation, businesses, sorry, and accommodation businesses with the tax and should instead provide a fair funding settlement to local authorities that fully support our tourism sector. Thank you, Ms Gozo. And I call on Daniel Johnson. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin, too, by thanking uh, the committee for their work through Stage 1 and 2, uh, to the committee clerks. Uh, and actually, I think I'd also just like to highlight uh, the way in which the Minister has approached this. I think Tom Arthur has done an excellent job, uh, and uh, I very much appreciate the numerous conversations. And it, and it is very pleasing to see uh, the, the, the subject of, of those conversations reflected in, in what we have in the bill. And I would thank him for that. And it, 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 that's important because getting this right is really important. Tourism is hugely important to the Scottish economy. And, and it's not hard to see why. Scotland is an amazing country to visit. Uh, it has a huge amount to offer, and we have a huge global reputation. And if tourism is important, the, the experience people have in our accommodation is absolutely critical to that. It's the touch point. It's the, 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 kind of the, the human element of that visitor experience. But I think we also have to acknowledge that, that with that come costs to local authorities. And potentially, a well-designed tax, if done properly, aligns the interests of both authorities uh, to uh, those that are being left, in this case, these businesses. And I think that's important, because while local authorities are very much critical to their local economies, they're not always connected to the upside of the economic growth. That the, the way that non-domestic rates are, are levied and redistributed doesn't mean that there's that direct connection. And particularly where tourism is concerned, I think a number of local authorities uh, uh, host visitors, uh, uh, but don't necessarily see the, the economic benefits of that, but do have the costs, which is why I think this has been an important measure. I, I would also acknowledge that this, uh, there's a, an inherent tension in the implementation of this in terms of providing clarity and consistency, but providing that direct economic link to local authorities. And that link is it's required that local authorities have the ability to adjust, amend, uh, uh, and get the detail right for their local uh, context. So it's why I was pleased to see the safeguards that have been introduced, particularly around uh, small business providers, the VAT threshold. I think it was right that the, the number of uh, days uh, 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 in terms of the long-term visits at least is in place. Uh, but but I, I, I do have some concerns around how straightforward this will be for people to understand and also local authorities to implement. And I think that is where we need to pay close attention to the statutory guidance as it's adopted and how this is implemented. I think particularly, I think the VAT point is worth noting, not just because of the threshold, 
but also I think we need to acknowledge that, that, that this will levy on top of VAT. Now, a number of contributors in the previous debate and in this have said, well, lots of other places around Europe have a visitor's levy. I think it's really important to put on the record here that very often those places have a lower rate of VAT for visitors or no VAT at all. And we are actually going to be placing a higher uh, uh, tax uh, burden on visitors than many other parts of Europe. And people do have an option where they, where they come. So while it's right that we have this level of detail set at a local level, I do ask local authorities to bear that in mind. That, that if you're going to make that comparison with other cities, understand that they are often uh, doing so in a different VAT uh, context. They also need to uh, bear in mind uh, the, the fact that uh, this is very much a recovering sector. Domestic tourists within the UK have not returned to pre-COVID levels, even though uh, overseas tourists might have. So this is why another reason why I think that the time uh, lead-in is important. So, and, and ultimately, what I would also say is that while introducing this levy is important, getting that detail right, I think it's very, much, uh, uh, very important that local authorities continue to monitor and reflect as circumstances change, which is what, why I was making the point about the ongoing basis, both at a national level but also at a local level. And at the end of the day, I think these forums could act like the tourist board uh, that we refer to, is that standing dialogue with the sector, with local authorities and indeed government. So let's get the detail right. Let's make sure the communication is right and let's make sure that this is a, a levy that works for local government and works for the industry and I believe that it can do if it's done correctly. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. We now move to closing speeches. I call Ross Greer on behalf of the Scottish Greens. Up to four minutes, please, Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's been about five years now since the Scottish Greens first secured the commitment to introduce this bill as part of uh, annual budget negotiations the last time we were uh, in opposition with a, a minority SNP government. Since then, we had a pandemic that delayed its introduction. It should have been introduced at the end of the last term of Parliament, but for understandable reasons, it was one of the bills that could not uh, be so. Uh, but that then put us in the privileged position of being in government with SNP colleagues while the bill was being developed. Um, and I'm glad of the work that we were able to undertake together, particularly with the Minister uh, Tom Arthur. And I would like to put on record our thanks to Mr Arthur for the excellent engagement, not just while our party was in government with SNP colleagues, which you would expect, but uh, since the end of the Butte House Agreement and with our move into opposition. I think this model of engagement is absolutely a model for working in what we now have, a parliament of minorities, where that outreach and approach to opposition parties will be essential. It's an example of the fact that the next two years can still be very productive for this parliament if we have that kind of cross-party collaboration. President officer, visitors contribute so much to our communities and to our local economies, but not very much to the local authorities who have to bear the cost of that. The, at the core of this bill is a principle that uh, local communities, local taxpayers, should not have to contribute all of the costs. I was struck uh, some years ago when Parliament took evidence from Madam McVeigh, the then leader of Edinburgh City Council, on the huge additional sums that were simply required to empty the bins in Edinburgh City Centre during the festival, the massive increase in cost for the local authority there, and the local authority that does not have much in the way of direct financial benefit from the festival, despite all the other immense benefits it brings. This bill begins to address that, and I think it will be of, of huge value in areas in my region, like Arran and Loch Lomond. And one area of the bill that I think is particularly well designed is that flexible approach that would allow, for example, Western Bartonshire Council to introduce, or I would prefer to work with Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park Authority to introduce a visitor levy uh, up, up the uh, west shore of Loch Lomond, where I think it would uh, be very lucrative, um, and to do so in a way that would not necessarily compel them to introduce it in other areas of the authority, like Clyde Bank, uh, where it may not be as helpful. And that money could then be reinvested in communities like Bala, who do benefit from the visitor economy, but who also see significant negative impacts at the moment. This money could be used to mitigate those and improve that local visitor experience. I would like to thank my colleague Ariane Burgess and Living Rent, Scotland's tenant union, uh, for their campaigning for confirmation that the scope of this bill would allow the proceeds to be spent on affordable housing. That is absolutely essential, uh, not just for local communities, but for local, particularly hospitality businesses in rural communities who are experiencing really acute labour shortages due to housing shortages. I am very glad that the Minister confirmed at stage two uh, that that would be the case, and I hope that will be reflected in the guidance. I've got one video 
very brief question for the Minister uh, before closing that we didn't quite cover at the end of Stage 3 amendments today. And it's just if he is, is in a position to outline a timescale for the commencement regulations for this bill. Should we be expecting uh, draft regulations to come before the end of this calendar year? What, uh, we would certainly be keen to have more of an understanding of the timescale for that. I was also very glad of the, the Minister's commitment to take the next steps towards a cruise ship levy for Scotland. Because a cruise ship levy is distinctly different from this uh, to a visitor levy. There are some similarities, but we believe certainly the Greens that a cruise ship levy should take into account the significant uh, pollution and other impacts from cruise ships, not just passenger numbers. And particularly given that there are cruise ships that can dock and depart in a single day, there should still be a way to apply that levy to them, even if there is no overnight stay within that local authority area. Mark Griffin and Willie Coffey were both right to point out that this bill, whilst having significant benefits for some authorities, will be uh, negligible for others. That is why it just needs to be one part of the picture in fiscal empowerment of local government. There is a range of other options we could take forward, a demolition levy, an incineration levy, a large events levy. Um, the Greens are certainly proud of those that are coming forward, like the carbon emission land tax uh, and what have already uh, been delivered, like the ability to double council tax on second and holiday homes. Officer, in closing, this is a good bill. It will become good law. It is well drafted, and Parliament has significantly improved upon it. It is an important power that will have a positive impact on local communities, but it must only be the next step in the fiscal empowerment of local government, not the final step. We need to give local government in Scotland the power to really govern our communities and our economy. We will certainly see the benefit if we do so, and we take that leap of trust in our elected colleagues at a local level. Thank you, Mr. Greer. I now call on Michael Mara to close on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to four minutes, please, Mr. Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Scottish Labour welcomes the completion of this bill and giving local authorities uh, the power to implement levies to help pay for services to support tourism. Um, and we believe it is right that councils have those powers themselves and that the balance has been pointed out by various members is struck between the framework that is set nationally and how this is implemented locally. And it is right that they make those decisions uh, themselves. Um, so I was uh, appreciative of um, uh, the, the Minister's words when he said that uh, re-emphasised that the government does not wish to be prescriptive about how this money is used and does not believe that that would be appropriate. Because Miles Briggs also pointed out some of the challenges in framework bills, which is something that in the Finance Committee in this Parliament we have talked about on numerous occasions. And I do think there is a challenge between getting the framework bill right in terms of setting the, the outline of this, making sure that Parliament has the proper scrutiny around it, um, but also giving the freedom to, for um, individual local authorities to make that work. And there is a tension, I think, to be governed in how we legislate um, in these areas. Because I do think there is an ancillary benefit that comes through empowering local government about building trust and capacity within uh, local government uh, so long uh, in, in decline. So it is important that we can support them in that. Um, but we d I do believe that our tax base should be more varied, um, and more resilient and more responsive. So we should not just think of it as an extractive process by which we try to take as much money as possible to fund the public services that we all want. Um, it's, it, also, we have to think also about taxation that is purposeful that talks about what it, uh, behaviours it can incentivise, what, what uh, behaviours it can encourage. And we should think about the intent of that taxation in its broader sense. Um, and so I think here is the, so the support for a tourism industry that is critical, but it is also disruptive. And Ross Greer, I think, uh, pointed that out well, between the rural areas and the urban areas, the different forms of challenges that are present themselves from bringing tourists, absolutely vital as they are to our economy and to our society, um, in, into Scotland and the challenges that we have to make. So we have to meet that balance of attractiveness, though to make sure that we can bring people here. It's an attractive place to come, not just phys uh, physically, but that actually the cost of coming here is an affordable thing for people to do. And Daniel Johnson set that out uh, at, some, at some length, and rightly so. So how do we get those tourists uh, to come? And actually pointing out clearly that issue about VAT and thinking very sensitively actually about the, uh, the, the uh, weight that we put on our critical businesses as they try to build their own industry and make sure that we can look for them to succeed. Um, I want to say a little bit about funding. I am absolutely clear, I think, that the funding should not, indeed cannot, 
be uh, coming out of this uh, levy in order to plug the gaps that are made by the huge cuts to council budgets that we have seen over many years. It can't be used as a substitute for other cuts. For example, uh, Dundee City Council SNP's plans to close Broughty Ferry Castle, Mills Observatory and Caird Park golf facilities, all vital tourism facilities um, in my home city. And that's driven, of course, by this government's decision to target local authority for cuts year on year. And there's a very um, useful column published in The Courier today um, by uh, Jim Spence, who, who uh, has said, and I quote, there's scarcely a whimper from those in city chambers as the fiscal knife is plunged deep into Dundee's back. Instead, there is hand-wringing acquiescence from our councillors and SNP MPs and MSPs as the city is skewered with cuts to services. I think it's absolutely right that we consider that context when we think about the money that might be generated uh, by this levy. Because Mark Griffin pointed out the Accounts Commission's uh, account of 23.6 per cent cuts already to leisure and culture in Scotland and the very huge challenges that they face as a result. We also know that the broader cuts, presiding officer, uh, to our uh, local authority budgets make the, uh, poorer health, declining education, less safe streets and less sustainable communities as we address that £6 billion Pounds black hole that results from the decisions of this government. So colleagues are right to welcome the constructive engagement of the Minister in this process of the Bill, and I welcome that too. Uh, we are glad to see movement on this measure, and it is vital that it is delivered sensitively for the good of all our communities. Thank you, Mr Mara. I now call on Murdo Fraser to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to five minutes, please, Mr Fraser. Thank you, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. The, the Minister, when he was uh, opening this short debate earlier, referred to the fact that there are uh, visitor levies in many other countries in Europe, and he's absolutely right to, to say that. However, there is a point in relation to Scotland, or indeed the UK as a whole, that we are a high-cost destination. I think Daniel Johnson made that point too in his contribution. The Scottish Tourism Index was published just the other day, a survey of a thousand Scots, and that showed that holidays at home, holidays by Scots in Scotland, are down already this year. Uh, last year at this point, 44% of Scots said they expected to take a holiday in Scotland this year. Uh, this year that figure is down to 40 per cent. So we are seeing a drop off in the number of people saying they're going to take holidays in Scotland. Now that doesn't suggest people are not taking holidays because the figures would indicate that outbound travel is up. So people are going elsewhere, they're less likely to stay here. And according to the Scottish Tourism Alliance, complaints about the costs of holidaying in Scotland are a driver to uh, those uh, numbers. Uh, and we know we have high VAT in this country compared to other countries. I think there's a, a good argument for reducing the VAT in hospitality, but that's a debate for another day. But there are other issues hitting the sector. The government, as we've debated in this chamber many times, did not pass on the 75 per cent raised relief for retail, hospitality and leisure that applies south of the border and has now done for two years. We see uh, a range of regulations coming forward, the regulation of short-term lets hitting uh, the sector, for example, and things like the uh, restri potential restrictions on alcohol advertising potentially impacting on visitor attractions such as distilleries. And my concern and our concern about the visitor levy being proposed is, while there might be an argument in principle for visitor levies, this comes at the wrong time for a Scottish tourist sector that is already really struggling with a rising cost base and, as we've heard, with uh, potentially reducing numbers. I mean, we've heard a lot over the past year about the New Deal for Business from this government. We've heard a lot from the new First Minister and the new Deputy First Minister about uh, the need to put economic growth first. This legislation, if it's passed today, sends out the wrong message in that respect. But that's the, issue, that's the argument in principle. If we look at some of the detail of what's in the bill, and we've, we heard this from my colleagues in the debate earlier, the burden of collection of this new levy will go on business, sometimes very small businesses, sometimes perhaps with not, with not sophisticated computer systems, they will have to bear the cost of collection. And Pam Gosso, my colleague, referred to this issue about VAT and the interaction between VAT and the, and the levy and the complication that will bring to sometimes very small micro-businesses such as bed and breakfast. 
We still haven't seen addressed an issue I raised uh, during the Stage 1 debate, which is the issue of motorhomes. Now, I heard from the Minister what he had to say earlier, that he will be uh, looking at this again. But this is a very serious issue because we are not levelling the playing field between motorhomes and people staying in uh, bricks and mortar accommodation. And already there are real concerns in many parts of rural Scotland, including around along the North Coast 500. People hire a motorhome, perhaps from somewhere in the central belt. They load it up with shopping. They drive around. They don't often even stay sometimes in regulated B&Bs, uh, regulated uh, campsites. They, they wild camp. They're not putting very little money into the local economy, and they will be exempt from paying the visitor levy as it currently stands. But people staying in B&Bs or in campsites, despite the efforts of Miles Briggs, will have to pay a levy. And that seems to be an inherent unfairness. So I welcome the fact that the Minister is going to address that. And we haven't seen, in my view, a proper assessment of the whole question of exemptions. This is not uh, a tourist tax, as Miles Briggs said. It's, a, it's an accommodation tax. So people for example, itinerant workers who have to be in a different part of the country to work, people visiting children in hospital, people who are, for example, flood victims who have to move out of their homes on a temporary basis will have to pay this tax. And I'm glad that Jeremy Balfour was able to get through his amendment uh, in relation to those who are disabled, but we should have gone much further in connection with exemptions. And finally, in terms of detail, when it comes to use of funds, it's really important, and this point was made by a number of, 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 of members, including uh, Mark Griffin. This cannot be a replacement for core funding for local government. This seems, needs to be seen as additional funding that we put in to measures that will benefit the tourist economy. So to close, uh, presiding officer, there is an argument in principle for visitor levy. However, what is brought forward here has, in our view, too many issues, too many problems with the detail, and it comes at the wrong time for this sector. I believe this government should have been listening to business and for that reason we will be voting against the bill tonight. Thank you. Thank you. I call on Tom Arthur to wind up. Up to six minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I thank members from across the Chamber for their measured contributions both during the amendment stage and in the uh, latterly in the debate and indeed for their constructive engagement throughout this process over the past year. I am extremely grateful, and I think that the uh, process that we have undertaken here, even when there has maybe not been agreement on the general principle of the Bill, but that desire to work together does show Parliament at its best, and I think the legislation is consequently stronger as a result. And I agree with what Ross Greer said. I think it is a, a model of working um, to ensure that in this era of minority government, we can effectively legislate and ensure to the greatest extent possible that all views are reflected. I will turn to matters that members have raised um, during the debate momentarily, but I do want to at this stage um, offer my sincere thanks um, to all of those who have contributed to enable this legislation to get to this stage. As this has been touched on, this uh, legislation um, was first mooted back in 2019 um, through an agreement between the Scottish Green Party and the Scottish Government during a budget. Um, and I am very grateful for Green colleagues' engagement throughout that process and during the Butte House Agreement and following the end of the Butte House Agreement as well. But I am extremely grateful in particular to COSLA and to industry who have provided me and my officials with invaluable insight and invaluable expertise to ensure that what we have brought to Parliament as a bill and indeed the amendments we have taken forward to Stage 2 and Stage 3 are generally additive and help to ensure that this legislation is the best that it possibly can be. I am particularly grateful, as I say, to the range of industry bodies, including the STA and many others, for the dialogue that they have facilitated for the individual businesses who have taken time to engage directly with me and my officials as we have taken that process forward. That, I think, is a, a model consistent with the New Deal for Business. And for me, it is of the utmost importance when we are dealing with any legislation, whether that be within the fiscal or regulatory domains that impacts upon business, that we bring to bear that lived experience and expertise of business. And it is because of that engagement that we have been able to achieve legislation, to achieve what I think is a broad consensus at stage three. I also have to put on record my sincere thanks to my Bill team, in particular Bill team leader uh, Ben Haynes. 
the contribution of Scottish Government officials is outstanding across every area of policy, but I have been incredibly privileged to be supported by such a fantastic range of officials through this, and that and they have played no small part at all in getting this bill to the stage it is today. And I would also want to pay, um, pay tribute and thanks to my ministerial colleagues, including the Deputy First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Ivan McKee, Richard Lockhead, and indeed Ben McPherson, who have all pre in previous roles have had responsibility for this legislation legislation and are directly um, accountable for the progress that has been made in getting the legislation to the place it is today. I want to turn, presiding officer, to just some of the individual um, issues that have been raised. I want to sincerely thank Miles Briggs for the way in which he has brought forward these amendments. And I, I very much appreciate the sentiment and the intent that motivated the national exemptions he brought forward. And I would want to reiterate, which if I I hope was implicit, but I would just want to make explicit my commitment to continued engagement. There are powers within the legislation to allow for the introduction of national exemptions, and clearly within the statutory guidance, consideration of exemptions will be a part of that. He makes very important points. I would just want to clarify that there is nothing inevitable that certain groups or certain um, categories of accommodation will be subject to a visitor levy. There is that local discretion, and of course any local authority looking to introduce a visitor levy will only be able to do so following consultation not just with business and tourism organisations but with communities as well. And the fact that there will be that ongoing engagement through the visitor levy forum I think provides a very effective vehicle for ensuring that the voices of communities are represented. And of course, as we continue to monitor how this legislation is implemented, ministers' door will doors will remain opened for further engagement on issues around national exemption. I, I recognise the points around variation. Um, I think that is ultimately inevitable with any um, um, situation where we seek to further empower local government. And what I have sought throughout this process is to ensure that we can provide as much administrative consistency between respective local authorities while allowing for that policy flexibility to respond most effectively to the needs and assets of a particular area. I think that is extremely important. Um, I want to thank um, Liam McCaffrey for, for his contribution and also recognise the important issues he raises with regards to a cruise ship levy um, and reiterate the commitments that I made earlier on this afternoon. And I recognise the particular importance to his constituents and indeed to constituents of other members in the, uh, um, in, the, in the Chamber who have a particular interest in how a cruise ship levy would be applicable to their area. And ministers remain committed to that continued engagement in that area. On the point around motorhome levies, which I know Mr uh, Motorhomes and their impact and a potential motorhome levy which both Liam McArthur and Murdo Fraser raised. Um, I would again want to reiterate commitments to work and engage constructively. There are particular practical challenges. It is a multifaceted issue, as members appreciate, and it is, as I'm sure we would all agree, a small minority of irresponsible users who, have great, who are directly um, contributing to some of the issues that have arisen. But I do recognise the concern there, and I think it's important we continue to work constructively to identify what measures we can take forward in that regard. I think as well, a key issue has been raised both by Daniel Johnson, by Michael Mara and indeed by Murdo Fraser is the question of the overall economic, fiscal and regulatory environment in which accommodation providers and those operating the wider visitor economy are currently operating. And of course, I recognise that it is a challenging environment in which you're in. And that is why having requirements around consultation and engagement are at the heart of this bill. It is why we have an expert group with industry representation along with local government convened by Visit Scotland producing that statutory guidance with Parliament, with ministers able to specify what that guidance will actually cover. I think that is going to be extremely important in ensuring visitor levies, when they are being considered by local authorities and engagement with their communities, are proportionate and additive. But I think fundamentally what a visitor levy can do, as has been set out by the STA and others, if effectively implemented by local authorities, can be a force for good, something that can promote economic growth, wealth creation and support entrepreneurship and ensure that Scotland continues to maintain and to grow and to diversify that world-class tourism offering for which we are all rightfully proud. Thank you. Thank you.
That concludes the debate on a Visitor Levy Scotland Bill at Stage 3. It is now time to move on to the next item of business. and I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 11.2.4 of Standing Orders that decision time be brought forward to now. And I invite the Minister for Parliamentary Business to move the motion. Move, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. The question is that decision time be brought forward to now. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And there's one question to be put, and that question is that motion 13349 in the name of Tom Arthur on Visitor Levy Scotland Bill be agreed. And as this is a motion to pass the bill at stage three, the question must be decided by division. So there'll be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.